signals from governments. He's failed to gain traction. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com, and iHeart Radio apps, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Economics. We are being taken out of our comfort zone by the coronavirus. Dollar weakness is pretty much a good thing for a lot of the rest of the world. Finance. We are going to see a global demand contraction this year, most likely, for oil. The financial health of the business sector has deteriorated somewhat. Investment. Obviously, the value in high vol stocks are going to continue to suffer. It looks as though the bond market is talking itself into a recession here. Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz on Bloomberg Radio. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance coming up, closing out the worst quarter since 2008. The White House laying the groundwork for another fiscal package and economic data showing China's economy slowly reopening. From the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio, hello Tuesday, here is your Tuesday morning price action. Equity futures all over the place overnight and into this morning once again. Equity futures now negative two points on the S&P. 500 down around about a tenth of one percent it feels like the longest q1 ever i know you all feel that way we do too the s&p 500 down almost 19 percent for q1 going into the final day of trading for the first quarter of 2020 in a bond market what a quarter has been for 10-year treasury starting the year at around about 192 and ending q1 at around about 70 basis points outside of that in the commodity market a quick look at crude oil with a bounce off an 18-year low, up 7.5% on WTI. It is volatile out there, $21.62. So, guys, markets are better than they were two weeks ago. China's economy is better in March versus February. But all round, Tom, Q1 ends in a much worse position than where it started. Yeah, I don't buy the markets are better. Yes, the stock market's had a very nice rebound, and maybe it's window dressing to frame up March 31. But, John, um, I look at dollar range bound here with strength, and the oil oil market is is a train wreck. Javier Blas talking about the tangible oil plats de- delivery well below $20 a barrel. Halima Croft of RBC Capital Markets, I thought with a brilliant note this morning on the massive demand disruptions within oil. So I, even though the stock market's done a little bit better, it's more than problematic. And Tom, you mentioned the FX market. Dollar strength back in a big way. Euro dollar down nine-tenths of 1% yeah. in today's session. Lisa, already, even before the $2 trillion fiscal package actually hits the economy, we're talking about another round of fiscal easing, another round of aid coming out of Washington, D.C. Yeah, the helicopters are going to be busy. Look, it's been such an insane quarter. It- it really cannot be overstated. Economic projections coming out of this are getting more and more tired. Goldman Sachs coming out this morning and saying, oh, did we say a 24% annualized contraction in the second quarter? We meant 34% contraction. But there is a silver lining. And when you talk about the dollar strength, it is easing a little bit. It does seem like financial stability is starting to return to some degree with just sort of the lubrication of the markets. This thanks, of course, to the Fed's fire hose and to those helicopters that you're talking about that are just going to keep printing. Uh, money. So yes, we're still seeing swings in the market, but it's not necessarily limit up, limit down the way that we saw it a couple weeks ago, John. Let's get to the first conversation of the morning, shall we? Pleased to say that Shahab Jalanous joins us now, Credit Suisse Head of FX and Macro Trading Strategy. Shahab, always great to get you on the program. Let's talk about it, shall we, Shahab? Dollar strength back on the table. Last week, we thought there were some signs of success from the Federal Reserve. Are we seeing signs of stress once again? I don't think so. I think what we're seeing right now uh, is a much anticipated month's end flow linked to changing hedge ratios, which this month happened to mean that uh, dollar buying is in order. Uh, there's, there's an anticipation that once this is out of the way, uh, the market will start to look again uh, at the underlying drivers of the dollar at this point. And that, for now, more broadly seems to be the capacity of the Fed in particular to, to provide dollars to the market via its various facilities, but also hopes for more U.S. fiscal stimulus, which historically would have been seen as a dollar positive, but at the moment um, this is seen as something that, again, helps put more dollars into the system. So as long as these factors are driving the market, I would imagine uh, dollar strength to be relatively uh, short term uh, and then after that, for the dollar to again start to trade in line with markets more broadly. If we're settling 
for the end of the first quarter, what is your positioning for the beginning of the second quarter? What is the Jalanu's strategy given the total chaos we're living in? It's, it's obviously a very tactical market. We can't pretend to try to have a, a, a fully strategic position uh, for an entire quarter when realized volatility is as, is as high as it is. We're taking each week as it comes at this point. Um, what I would say, though, is that uh, the markets already uh, are pricing in fairly negative outcomes uh, for the second quarter in terms of data. So to undershoot these negative outcomes uh, in terms of actual outcomes is actually going to be quite a tall order now at this point. Um, and I do believe that there's still more of a focus at this point on the possibility of more stimulus measures. For example, Japan has just announced, uh, or is looking at announcing a, a very large package of its own as well. So as these come through, I believe that these still help, uh, at least within the G10 space, the pro-risk currencies, the likes of the Australian dollar, uh, the Canadian dollar, uh, in the very near term. Um, but I think in the, in the medium term, to see a real turnaround uh, in these types of currencies, we do need to see other factors come through. So for example, we do need to see oil prices base. We do need to see virus uh, infection growth rates come down so that markets can believe uh, transport around the world can resume again. These are the types of things that are still the big unknowns from a medium-term perspective. So those helicopters that Tom Keane uh, talks about all week and has been talking about uh, for the past few weeks, dropping money uh, into his triple, triple leverage cash fund, they're going to continue, and in the short term, maybe that won't necessarily debase the dollar. Over the long term, though, how does the U.S. get out of this other than just printing money and leading to inflation and a debasement of the dollar? Well, look, I think the, the key here is, you know, FX at the end of the day is still a, a relative price. Um, and the truth of the matter is all the other central banks are doing the same thing in one form or another. In fact, even what you know, would have been seen as, as very difficult a few years ago, which is emerging markets uh, doing quantitative easing, um, without necessarily seeing their currencies getting crushed, you know, that's also happening right now. So... Um, across a broad range of emerging markets. So the truth of the matter is it's, it's very difficult to look at the dollar in isolation from that perspective, given that everyone else is doing the same thing. So when we talk about debasement, it could be the case that we see down the line a general rise in price levels uh, around the world on mm -hmm. a liquidity basis. That's not necessarily going to mean that the dollar falls against other currencies uh, in, a, in a material way, um, given that that is a very common policy at this point in time. If someone comes to you, Shahab, and says, I have a belief oil will recover in some way or form, what is the best way to express strong oil? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at things like futures prices, um, futures, because the situation is that there's so little storage available for oil right now, um, it means that futures prices uh, are actually much higher than spot prices. Uh, and therefore, trying to buy, you know, oil for future delivery through futures, for example, uh, you'll be paying a much higher price than the spot price anyway. So um, I'm not sure that there is a very efficient and simple way of getting around this conundrum. Um, if you have access to cheap storage, you could try to buy... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have that. <laughs> we moved, um, we've moved afterthought out. We're putting the tankers <laughs> in our bedroom. <laughs> Barrels of oil, John. We're not all big players, Shahab. We can't go and get a super tanker. Barrels, and start storing I say. Some crude. <laughs> Let's talk about I'm foreign exchange. Tough, Let's yeah. talk about I'm... foreign exchange and what you're seeing in the data out of China. Some confusion in the PMIs. The PMIs, it's not the twin of GDP. It's a derivative of GDP. And all you're asking people in China at the moment, are things better this month than last month? And the answer to that question is Yes. But does that mean output has recovered what it lost in February? The answer to that is no. So, Shahab, talk to me about the trajectory you're looking for for the Chinese economy. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. So according to our, our Credit Suisse China economist, um, by his calculations, all the, all the big jump in the PMI shows in March is that uh, the level of activity is now only 29 uh, is now only 25% below uh, its peak levels as opposed to 29% in February. So it's still a long way down. It's just improved a bit. Uh, so in that context, 
We don't believe that the Chinese currency is on the verge of, of, uh, of a dramatic recovery at this point. Uh, ultimately, China just this week cut rates again uh, and added more money to the system. Again, to your point around helicopter money, um, you know, even in China, where there is already a, a large, or people fear, uh, a large debt problem potentially brewing down the line. What's still going on is, is more money being pumped into the system. So uh, we do believe that that will keep the renminbi somewhat contained. Uh, and what applies to the renminbi applies across the emerging market space. Uh, so for those looking for a dollar turnaround, it's easier in our view to play that uh, within the G10 complex, within uh, the higher quality currencies, you could say, uh, than some of the, the, the riskier currencies at this point in time that are still plagued by weak growth. Um, China is one of those, I guess, but, uh, but again, in LATAM as well, for example, um, plagued by weak growth, but have maybe weaker underlying fundamentals at a structural level as well, and are still experimenting with, with quantitative easing as well in some cases. Brazil is another one that might do this, for example. So these, these put huge question marks, these kinds of issues around yeah. uh, these riskier currencies. Shahab, always great to get your thoughts on a program. Our best to you and yours. Shahab Jalanus, Credit Suisse's head of FX and macro trading strategy. Let's get you some headlines, some news worldwide. We can do that from New York City with Michael Park. Good morning to you, Michael. Good morning, John. Tom, Lisa, the mounting death toll from the virus outbreak in the United States is poised to overtake China's grim tally of 3,300 deaths. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has a message for the rest of the country. Please come help us. Cuomo says up to a million more health care workers are needed in New York City. Hard-hit Italy and Spain have already overtaken China and now account for more than half of the nearly 38,000 COVID-19 deaths worldwide. In a conference call with the nation's governors, President Trump continued to paint an optimistic picture about the fight against the coronavirus. However, Bloomberg's Martin DeCaro reports it comes as there is a shortage of coronavirus test kits and other medical supplies. President Trump reportedly told the governors the lack of test kits is no longer a problem. Another remark at odds with the reality state leaders say they're facing as hospitals prepare for a surge of coronavirus infections. Aubrey Lane is Virginia's finance secretary. He says the federal response has been uncoordinated and disjointed. Pretty much every state for themselves. Prices are sometimes opportunistic, I'll put it that way. And it would have been great if there would have been a national strategy. It looks like we're moving towards that now, thankfully. Governors nationwide say their hospitals still lack enough ventilators, swabs, and other basic supplies. In Washington, Martin DeCaro, Bloomberg Radio. Israel's prime minister has tested negative for the coronavirus, but he remains in self-quarantine at his residence in Jerusalem. Benjamin Netanyahu and his staff were checked again for COVID-19 after a close aide fell ill on Sunday. Global News, 24 hours a day on Air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. John? Michael Barr, thank you very much, sir. Michael Barr there with the news, the headlines worldwide. Let's get you some price action this Tuesday morning. The trading ranges are a little bit narrower. I have to say that. A couple of months ago, yeah. this would have been a wide trading range, Tom, but it's narrow relative to what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Your lows down six-tenths of one percent, your highs up nine-tenths of one percent. And in the here and now, right now, Tom Keane, equity futures down seven points. We're off by a third of one percent. Yeah, yesterday's close was really something. I mean, you know, I, I think that really caught a lot of people by surprise. I certainly don't want to get out front of what we're going to see on a Tuesday and a quarter. But um, I, I would look away from the equity markets and, again, oil and bonds. I mean, I'm sorry, John, bonds speak. Those yields are shocking as you open, as you open the show with. Yields coming in, four basis points today. We're down a whole lot more than that on the year so far. We'll talk about that and credit a little bit later in the program. We'll get Lisa's views on the amount of issuance that we've had over the last couple of weeks. Right now, we're down four basis points on a 10-year treasury to 0.68%. Alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with Lisa Abramovitz. This is Bloomberg. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. 
every day. Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Imagine. Imagine being denied an apartment because of your religion or your race or because you have children or a disability. It's so wrong. Yes, but who has the power to stop this? You do. Each of us has the power. The law is on your side. It's illegal for landlords to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. If you suspect that you have experienced housing discrimination, file a complaint with HUD immediately so we can investigate it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. To learn more, visit HUD.gov slash fair housing. That's HUD.gov slash fair housing. Or call 1-800-669-9777. 1-800-669-9777. A public service message from HUD in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. We need to tackle coronavirus together. You can help by not traveling unless it is absolutely essential. With limited staff, TfL is supporting journeys for critical workers only, especially the NHS and emergency services. No one else should be traveling. If you must travel, try to avoid the busy times, particularly the early morning. We have already seen fewer people using our services. Thank you for doing your bit. Stay at home. Do not travel. Save lives. This week at Tesco, large Easter eggs are three for eight pounds. And we've got a large choice too on all your favorite brands, including Terry's Chocolate Orange, Cadbury's and Maltesers. A three for eight pounds? Why shell out more? Tesco. Every little helps. Available in the majority of larger stores and online, delivery charges may apply on 13th of April. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, I'll talk with our Washington correspondent about the many political battles being waged in the Capitol over how to deal with the new coronavirus. You couldn't imagine a president personalizing a crisis with a virus, but somehow that's, that's where we are. Susan Glasser. Listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. U.S. stock index futures are fluctuating. Well, European stocks are headed for a fifth increase in six sessions amid debate over whether the market meltdown has ended given the continued spread of the coronavirus. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures down five points. Dow futures down 15. NASDAQ futures up 10. The DAX in Germany is up half percent. Ten-year Treasury up 13 30 seconds. Yield 0.68 percent. The yield on the two-year 0.22 percent. Nine Crude oil up seven and a quarter percent, up a dollar forty-five to twenty-one fifty-four a barrel. Comex gold is down one point nine percent, or thirty-one dollars twenty cents at sixteen twelve an ounce. The euro one point oh nine three nine against the dollar. British pound one point two three four six, and the yen at one oh eight point six zero. Oil producers Exxon Mobil and Occidental Petroleum among those jumping in the pre-market as crude rebounds after a three-day slump. Exxon's up two point seven percent this morning. Occidental up five point seven percent. Marathon oil up seven. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom, John, and Lisa. Karen, thank you. Thank you very much. The latest news out of Washington, D.C. Before a $2 trillion fiscal package even takes effect, before the SMEs get their loan and you get checks in the mail, we are already talking about another round of aid, Tom. According to people familiar with the matter, White House officials compiling lists of requests from government agencies totaling roughly $600 billion. 
When the facts change, I change. And, John, they changed about 12 noon yesterday. I don't know the exact time at Bloomberg, but Macy's came out and had this strange new word, furloughed. We were furloughed. And uh, it was extraordinary, folks. I sat with a New York Times article this morning and just added up the tens of thousands of jobs gone from six, seven, eight retailers. And, John, I came out in the vicinity of 400,000. Kevin Cirilli is our chief Washington correspondent. Kevin, it's happening in real time. It's hard for Washington to react in real time as well. We're going to have a double-digit plus, plus, plus unemployment rate. What's next? More stimulus. Um, and, and, and in <coughs> fact, I mean, you know, I've, I haven't started my daily round of calls <laughs> because I'm trying to let people sleep just a little longer as they wake up to this new reality. But yesterday, the big takeaway from all of my conversations with people on both sides of the aisle was that they want to see how this week goes in disseminating all of the last round of the economic stimulus. And, you know, yesterday, former Vice President Joe Biden's team held a conference call, Tom, uh, with uh, uh, all of the congressional chiefs of staff of members who have endorsed Biden. And one of the things that Biden's going to be pushing for is a student debt forgiveness as well uh, of up to $10,000, as well as... uh, uh, increasing uh, social security benefits. And in addition, he's going to try to make this contrast on oversight of the first round of stimulus that he's going to you know, argue that he's going to see whether or not uh, there's any corruption in how this money's being handed out. All right. So let's go into some of the details. So the bill that yes. was passed last week provided direct payments of $1,200 <clears throat> for each adult, $500 for each child, and it got phased out for individuals making more than $75,000 a year, couples making more than $150,000 a year. The new bill that's being drafted with Nancy Pelosi, House Speaker, taking the charge. Uh, It's attempting to increase food stamp benefits, expand family leave, uh, include uh, pension guarantees, infrastructure projects. The nearest date that we might get some sort of coherent plan with some sort of agreement is April 20th. How realistic is it that this gets passed in short order, frankly, to provide the need that Tom was talking about to all those hundreds of thousands of furloughed employees? You know, I got to be frank here. I think that this round of stimulus could be much more of a significant political fight than even the last one. Okay, but but this is important. John Farrell, this seems foreign to you, doesn't it? Isn't it done differently in the United Kingdom? Well, that's because you don't need a bipartisan approach in the United Kingdom yeah. right now because the Conservative Party has a majority. The apparatus and the system of procedure you need to go through down in Washington is just different, Kevin. You need to get on with a lot of different constituencies to get things done. And I'm thinking of the president right now trying to get on with a series of governors, not just from the Republican Party, but from the Democratic Party as well. How important are those relationships going to be in the coming months? Huge. I mean, and and I was speaking to a source yesterday who told me just how crucial uh, uh, Chairman Neal is going to be. Richard Neal is going to be uh, the the Democrat from Massachusetts. And that's someone that Speaker Pelosi has really, really enjoyed working with, I was told yesterday. Uh, He's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and really is is becoming the go-to person for Speaker Pelosi in terms of navigating all of the different uh, budget request, for lack of a better word, for, for the economic stimulus. So you've got Chairman Neal on one side. And then here's a name that I don't think people, that people in our audience should be familiar with, uh, Javita Carranza, who is the uh, head of the Small Business Administration. Did you notice that she wasn't at the signing of the economic stimulus bill, Tom? She wasn't even there. SBA, which got like, what, $250 billion worth? And she's not even there? Okay. They're trying to s- protect her from being a polarizing political face in this because they want to keep her as an apolitical type uh, throughout this. That's the strategy for why you haven't been seeing much of Javita uh, publicly. Well, Kevin, this raises a question. If this is going to be even more of a political fight, for people who are trying to factor in additional rounds of helicopter money into their economic and market models, is this unrealistic that we'll see in the short term because this will turn into such a political fight? Or are they going to still pass something in the near future, an additional round of stimulus? They will pass something, but I think that the, the fight leading up to it is going to be even more uh, partisan just simply because all these lawmakers are back home and they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to duke it out. I, I would note just on that one particular point that you just mentioned uh, as it relates to, to cash, 
this is an untold small and medium sized business company and in, in, in terms of the furloughs the the idea that Washington needed another week to pass that latest round of economic stimulus bill that cost businesses because a lot there were several businesses based upon my reporting and experience that furloughed workers because they didn't think that the stimulus was coming yeah. and now those same people who were furloughed or laid off the 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 top of those companies are wondering well can we hire them back on to and get, and still qualify for for the SBA uh, the SBA server not server the SBA phone lines were were inundated uh, yesterday with calls uh, and and so much so that there was a significant backlog I'm curious to see, and I have not been able to find the answer to this, how SBA is managing a massive educational push for 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 folks uh, all over the country. I'm surprised that that hasn't materialized significantly yesterday. Kevin, I agree with you. I'm hearing the same thing. It's always great to catch up with you. Kevin's really down in Washington. Kevin, a thanks. ton of confusion, Tom, around the sequencing of I, the fiscal package and some SMEs stuck in the middle of nowhere. I, I, you know, I know you guys do it better because it's a government and, you know, I get the politics, John. I, I just don't think they understand what people need is money to to pay rent. Uh, we have Muhammad Yunus coming up from Gallup, and he'll be brilliant on this. He was and then he did it yesterday, not next brilliant. week. It was quick for Washington. It wasn't quick enough. From New York, from New York City this morning. Why do hedge funds and other alternative managers rely on Pershing for a highly personalized experience? Mark Alderati, a managing director at BNY Mellon's Pershing and head of Prime Services, explains. In today's fast-paced environment, where the only constants are change and volatility, you need a prime broker who's both steady and agile, focused on supporting your needs so that you can focus on growing your business and producing results. Exceptional client service and advocating for our clients is at the core of what we do. Our award-winning high touch team is just one of the benefits of working with BNY Mellon. We help alternative investment managers create great experiences for their clients. Whether it's customized financing, securities lending solutions, platform access, or outsourced trading, BNY Mellon's Pershing is a prime broker who's committed to this business and dedicated to meeting your evolving demands. To learn more about the unique and industry-leading solutions for hedge funds and other alternative managers, visit Pershing.com. Pershing LLC. Member FINRA, NYSE, SIPC. Message and data rates may apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at babble.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. Listen to Raj Go. Polyrhythm, paradiddle. A drum solo so epic, he nearly forgot his mom's birthday back in Delhi. Good thing Raj has Western Union on his phone and can send money quickly online. Download the app today. This service is provided by Western Union. FX gains apply. The moment you realize you've drilled through an electric cable. The moment you realize that doesn't just mean no telly on the wall, but no telly full stop. The moment you realize you've got British gas home care. And not just your electrics, but your plumbing, heating and drains are all covered. So the moment you've got a problem, make it our problem. British Gas, here to solve. Search British Gas Home Care. Sky Store brings movies from the big screen straight to your TV screen. See what's new tonight. Who's the Yeti on my roof? <gasps> Stay in for a cool adventure with Abominable. You 
You can do magic? Watch the latest movie straight from the cinema. I promise to take Everest home. Wow. But he's not home yet. Abominable. Available now in Sky Store. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you, I beg you, to come down here right now! Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong With Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk Is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119 and around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. For our audience worldwide, we are live on Bloomberg Radio, two hours away from the open and in New York. Here is your price action this Tuesday morning. Equity futures down six points on the S&P 500, negative one quarter of one percent. What a Q1 it's been. The S&P 500 down almost 19 percentage points over the last three months. In the bond market, the state of play as follows. Treasury yields coming in four basis points to 0.68 percent. In foreign exchange, a stronger dollar story against pretty much the whole of G10. A much stronger dollar. Euro dollar coming in one percentage point. At Outside of that, a rally in the commodity market for crude after an ugly low from yesterday's session. South of 20, now $21.64 on WTI. On the Fed front, no scheduled Fed speak for today's session. And on the economic data front, we are light on the data front. The data picking up through the week, Tom. ISM's coming out tomorrow yep. together with the ADP report. Then we'll get claims and then we'll get non-farm payrolls. This came up last night over the dinner table. We were ordering out support in the restaurants in New York, John, and it came up, you know, Afterthought turned to me and said, did we learn anything from the Fed interviews? Michael McKee's been on a tear, Bostick, Kaplan, Bullard. Have we learned anything in these interviews, or are they just sort of going along as they go along, trying to manage the message forward? Managing the message forward and ready yeah. to do a whole lot more, and I have to say, some signs of success over the last week or so. Lisa, the primary market, reopening for investment-grade companies, We've had a ton of issues. Amazing. Yeah. amazing. The high yield market, finally, an issuer coming to market <laughs> and supplying some bonds and investors jumping all over it. Yum Brands coming out with the a junk bond issuance. Everybody cheered. You know, the junk bond market is open. <laughs> Everything is solved. No, I mean, in all honesty, the rush of issuance has just been traumatic in the investment grade space. A record $109 billion last week. The monthly supply for March exceeding okay. $200 billion, which surpasses the $177 billion uh, well, peak back in May 2016. Just both, incredible rush. Well, this is great, but to both you, and particularly the agony that the real yield is on hiatus, look for that returning folks sometime this fall. <laughs> um, you know, to, to the, I the hope two that long, seriously. Yeah, we're I hoping uh, to the two of you. I think this is important. Why? What's the why here? Why well, is there such a demand? Well, why is there demand or why is there supply? The supply is obvious because companies want liquidity. No, the, the demand, demand story, insatiable. but the demand story is fascinating. First of all, you have the Federal Reserve saying that they're basically going to backstop the investment grade bond market because they're going to be buying it through this facility that will be managed by BlackRock. Right. So, on one hand, you have that. On the other hand, and this is fascinating, the Wall Street Journal publishing a story saying that stock investors were actually going over to the investment grade bond market and buying this debt because they found the yields attractive and because they don't want to touch stocks right now. Just to give you a sense of the diversified buyer base at this point, John. Well, yields are twice what they were a couple of weeks ago, and the Fed's around the kitchen sink at it. And a lot of people saying, why not? I have no idea if it can continue at this rate because it's been coming so quick and so it fast. Is. And I think, Tom, if you address the technical issues, I don't think you've addressed the fundamentals at all. We're still yes. on a shutdown. We've still got some messy yeah. defaults to come. And the it's, earnings profile, the picture just, for the rest of the year, ugly. You guys, you guys explain that so beautifully. I'm tearing up here. I miss you guys. I miss you guys. Oh, we miss you too. I don't believe you. I 
do. I'm going to take whatever I can get here, isolated in my little apartment. Do you, you don't, that sounded so disingenuous. <laughs> I don't care. I'm socially okay. distanced. I'll you, take it. You can have we it. Miss, we miss Patrick Armstrong. Bring him we in. Do. I'm, I'm happy to say he's on the phone with us. Patrick Armstrong, Florimi Wealth CIO. Patrick, things have got a little bit better over the last couple of weeks. Are you encouraged? I'm encouraged, and I, I think I'm sort of what you've just described in the last section, is we've been adding to risk in the portfolios, and we've been doing it through the corporate bond space. Um, that's one area I feel a bit more comfortable with the Fed backstop. And uh, we started buying it a bit too early. We were buying it mid-March. But uh, <coughs> with the Fed supporting investment-grade bonds, um, I was buying subordinated bank in uh, UK debt, actually, yesterday. I was buying Barclays and Lloyds Bank, and I'm getting 4% yield on one-year paper from these companies right now in the UK. Wow. In the US, I've been selling put options on LQD, the uh, investment-grade ETF, and implied vol on equities. Everyone knows about the VIX every day where it's going to, but implied vol on LQD is 27% for May right now. So you can get a 5% premium just for selling a May at the money put. So you don't even, if LQD doesn't move, you can make 5% just betting it doesn't move lower. So. Implied vol is high in investment grade, bank subordinated debt. You're getting big yields versus zero interest rates on uh, the safe treasuries and gilts in the UK and the US. Well, you know, one thing that I'm wondering, you're talking about delving into risk, and I'm struggling to understand where you draw the line. And when John was talking about the fundamentals, that's honestly what's on my mind. I'm looking at the triple B rated index where 10% of it is uh, tied to energy companies, oil prices falling off a cliff. At what point does that matter when you start taking this risk and delving into what looks like yield, but could be nothing if there are defaults? Yeah, definitely. And it's the junk bond in the energy market that I think is being priced uh, for the disaster. The investment grade is still being priced for something pretty terrible. And with the, the LQD ETF I mentioned, you're getting about, yeah, it's 10% in the broad ETF as well, not just on the triple Bs in uh, the energy companies. The double A stuff will be fine, I think. But uh, with oil prices down near $20, um, bad news. That's the risk of doing it in the aggregate way with the ETF. But I really think it's the names that are already junk that are the ones at risk. Uh, the market's yeah. pricing those things well below 50. And I was looking at spreads, actually. Uh, I'm Canadian, and uh, Hardisty Heavy Oil in Canada, the price on that, you're getting $5.50 a barrel right now because of the differentials. And uh, that's oil that's going to be shut down right now. Those companies that are producing there, obviously, you're not profitable at $5 a barrel. Um, I saw Oklahoma Sours at about $6 a barrel right now. So spot oil prices are being decimated. But if uh, you've got any sour oil or heavy oil, if those prices are down near zero now. Patrick, in the equity markets, and maybe people are in and they were in like John Farrell buying at the bottom. I mean, I'm not in. I'm in the cash fund. But, but you know, they're in and they've made a nice pop off the bottom. If you want to acquire equity here, are you buying the beleaguereds or are you buying the things that have been front running out of this crater? Which one do you buy? I'm still in the quality count for equities we've been buying um, because I just, the companies like Boeing and Carnival, they're relying yeah. on bailouts at this point. I don't see <clears throat> significant upside without being diluted massively on the equities there. Companies like Alphabet and uh, Apple, they've got tons of cash. Their business model isn't going to be significantly impaired in the long term. They're not going to do anything dilutive. So I'd rather pay a bit of a premium, get into quality companies that don't have debt issues, don't have anything that's basically seen their business model destroyed. So I'd prefer quality growth at this point over the uh, the things that look incredibly cheap at five and six times earnings because those earnings aren't going to be realized. Patrick, forgive me thinking out loud, but these are the kind of things that I'm thinking about at the moment. Are we witnessing some kind of regime change where over the previous several years, in fact, for much of the last decade, companies were using the balance sheet to feed the hopes and dreams of equity investors, loading up on buybacks and borrowing to do so? Have we seen a shift? And will that shift live with us long after this health crisis fades where people are in balance sheet repair mode? We go into a balance sheet recession and for those companies that drop from IG to junk they try and repair things to get back up again is that the focus for credit right now away from equity that's the reason it is always in bear markets that you do get the regime change and that's the million dollar question what's the new regime coming out of it um for me i'm <clears throat> there probably will be a value cycle at some point coming out of it. I think it's too early to call that right now. I think it's probably even too early to be going aggressively into broad indices. I prefer the quality. 
Um, in terms of the junk names, I think that's not even where I'm thinking. I'm thinking it's the free money that used to go to companies that had no path to profitability. So the WeWorks of the world, right. um, companies like Uber, it was business models. They all had a path to an IPO. It wasn't a path to profitability. They wanted to get to the IPO, borrow money, get private equity investment, IPO, and that's where things would be monetized. I think that business model could be done forever because people realize there's risks with companies like that. Um, yeah. When you don't ever have a path to profitability, you can't rely on uh, free money the way you used to because uh, there are spreads now and uh, for good reason. Yeah, the siren there is the Uber police coming to get John Farrow's 8,000 shares he bought. <laughs> that, that's me. IPO. That's you, Lisa. <laughs> that's me. You know, no, the sirens we, all we make, day long. We make jokes about the sirens, but it is extraordinary, folks, in New York City, uh, particularly at night, to hear... Uh, the many sirens. Patrick Armstrong, thank you so much with Plurimi. That was brilliant, particularly on uh, equity looking at fixed income for coupon. The Bloomberg NJIT STEM report always brought to you by New Jersey Institute of Technology, designated an innovation and economic prosperity university for its support of business and community development. More at njit.edu. Here's Bob Boone. Tom, Lisa, Jonathan, good morning. Here's what's making news in science, technology, engineering, and math. The lesson of the day is online, and here's a hint. It's brought to you by the letters M and S. Wash hands now. More on helping kids cope in a moment. First, the trouble with testing. Despite President Trump's continued claim that coronavirus testing is going just fine, state officials aren't so sure. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker is still waiting for supply to meet demand, complaining that less than half the 10 thousand daily tests recommended by health experts are being carried out in his state and the los angeles times reports that while hospitals doctors and governments across the country were being encouraged by federal officials and the commercial lab quest diagnostics to send covid19 tests to a single southern california lab for processing the resulting bottleneck created a wait of eight or more days on some tests changes have now been made for those tests to be sent to other labs across the country the la times reports results can still vary between a day or two to up to a week. And parents stuck at home trying to help their shut-in kids cope with the coronavirus lockdowns can go online for resources from downloadable, printable, and colorable hand-washing instructions from the Muppets on the PBS.org website to videos and songs at SesameWorkshop.org, including an updated version of the popular Brushy Brush tune. There are also tips there, like turning the proper way to sneeze into a game of Catch a Sneeze with Your Elbow, and links to hundreds of free Sesame Street e-books. That's the Bloomberg NJIT STEM report. Tom, Lisa, John. Bob Moon, um, thank you, I think. Um, should we get you some news, some headlines worldwide? We'll do that from New York City with Michael Barr. Good morning to you, Michael. Good morning, John, Lisa, Tom. Governors in many states are still finding it difficult to obtain medical supplies for their states, from masks to ventilators. Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo says for her, it's like the Hunger Games trying to find the medical supplies her state needs, no matter where it comes from. I'm not asking for a lot. I'm not asking for more than we need. But I'm out there literally every day and all night scouring the globe to try to find the necessary life-saving equipment that we need here in the state of Rhode Island. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine says social distancing is helping his state tamp down numbers of potential infections. But he also says it's not yet time to relax restrictions. We're into a crucial period of time. And my message to my fellow Ohioans is we can't let up now. We've got to really, really stay at this uh, or, or we're going to see this uh, don't come at us even stronger. The Florida preacher who was arrested for defying a local safer at home order by holding regular Sunday service at his Tampa mega church is out of jail. The sheriff's office contacted Rodney Howard Brown to remind him of the county orders to limit gatherings to slow the spread of the coronavirus. But on Sunday, the members of the river at Tampa Bay Church were shoulder to shoulder. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. John, Lisa, Tom.
Michael Barr, thank you, sir. Michael Barr there with the news, your headlines worldwide from New York City. Here's your price action in New York as we grind towards, edge towards the opening bell in New York City. One hour and 47 minutes away. The situation as follows. Equity futures down 12 on the S&P 500. Negative around about a half of 1%. From New York this morning, good morning. We're live on Bloomberg Radio. With the Bloomberg Business of Sports Report, I'm Michael Barr. The Tokyo Olympics will open next year in the same time slot scheduled for this year's games. Tokyo organizers say the opening ceremony will take place on July 23rd, 2021. That is almost exactly one year after the games were due to start this year. The IOC and Japanese organizers last week postponed the Olympics because of the coronavirus pandemic. The rescheduled closing ceremony will be on August 8th. The Tokyo Olympic organizers have asked the game's sponsors, which include General Electric and Procter & Gamble, to extend their assistance into 2021 amid the disruption. Last week, the head of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, said all the sponsors of the Tokyo 2020 Olympics will retain their sponsorship rights despite the postponement of the games. Most affected from the delay are the 66 local Japanese sponsors. And that is a Bloomberg Business of Sports report. I'm Michael Barr. Vatsal Shah is Senior Project Engineer at Mott McDonald, a global engineering consultancy with more than 16,000 employees. He earned his PhD at New Jersey Institute of Technology and as an adjunct professor is helping NJIT students explore emerging technologies. My focus is renewable markets, emerging technologies, the idea of floating cities. What are we doing to develop that? What will happen to the in the water? Well, you're going to have waves hitting it. You're going to have solar. How are you going to you know, develop plants? How are you going to develop vegetation and farming? That sort of thought process happens at NGIT. We actually plan out what will the city look like? How do we develop that? So in 10 years, we're actually ready to take on those challenges when we have our first development in the water. NGIT also has been doing a lot of work in self-healing materials. So taking the polymers and the, the new material that we have in our material sciences departments and putting them into things like concrete, things like steel, reinforcing our soil. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. On this week's On the Media, we are awash in messages, but some messengers are more effective than others. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. Meanwhile, some media outlets choose not to air the president's press briefings live, and media critics ponder what's the right balance between good information and all information. All that and more on this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you, I beg you to come down here right now! Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong with Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. Breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. U.S. stock index futures are now moving lower while European stocks are headed for a fifth increase in six sessions. I'm in debate over whether the market meltdown has ended given the continued spread of the coronavirus. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. S&P futures are down almost 13 points. Dow futures down 82. NASDAQ futures Futures down about seven. The DAX in Germany is little change. Ten-year Treasury up thirteen thirty seconds, yield 068 percent. Yield on the two-year 022 percent, and the thirty-year yield one point three one percent. Nymex crude oil up six point eight percent, up a dollar thirty-seven at twenty one forty-six a barrel. Comex gold is down one point nine percent, or thirty dollars ninety cents at sixteen twelve thirty an ounce. The euro one point oh nine four five against the dollar. British pound one point two three three nine. The yen one oh eight point seven one, and the VIX is at fifty six. Point 
5684. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom, John, and Lisa. Karen, thank you. Thank you very much. EM does not have the luxury that DM has at a time of crisis. DM, developed markets, can do something countercyclically on the fiscal side, a luxury that many people, many countries, Tom, in emerging markets do not have at a critical juncture. It is true, and EM has been extraordinary. We have to say thank you to Damien Sassar of Bloomberg, who's really been just outstanding on these dynamics. With us now, with a broader picture of the emerging markets, is Carmen Reinhardt. She is at Harvard Kennedy School, but far more than that, has been our most astute academic on the linkages of the developed world to emerging markets. Carmen, John and Lisa really want to dive into emerging markets. I totally agree with them. But I've got to ask you, in your magisterial effort with Ken Rogoff, back to the Spanish Armada, I remember reading your chapter on this time is different in the Spanish Armada. What does your tome say about pandemics? What, in your study of 800 years with Ken, what did you learn about pandemics? Uh, Tom, I recently wrote a piece for, for a project syndicate basically saying this time it's truly different because we haven't lacked pandemic uh, but in history, but the kind of policy reaction to try to save lives by basically shutting down economies is this is this is this time is different. It's new. So the idea of using past pandemics to throw light on what's going on, I don't think it will work. The major one, the influenza of 1918, was during World War I. We had 9% real GDP growth in 1918 because of the war effort, not because, you know, there were measures like what we're seeing taken today. So it's limited, very limited, what we can draw. Professor Reinhardt, Adam Tews, a Columbia professor, wrote a piece for Foreign Policy that was pretty stark, and it said the coronavirus is the biggest emerging markets crisis ever, saying that the pandemic is starting to topple one of the pillars of the globalization era. His argument was that this time is different, as you say, in part because the developed market, the developed world, cannot assist the emerging markets right now, given what we're seeing. Do you agree with him that this is the biggest crisis ever facing that, that sector? Well, it's certainly as big as the 1930s, which was very big. Uh, And it has the added dimension that it goes well beyond its origins are not in the economy, but its origins are in health. So, yes, it's, it's, it's a stark, stark situation. Professor Jonathan here, we've talked many times, just to jump in if I can, forgive me, we've talked many times about dollar-denominated debt building up in emerging markets over the last 10 years or so. Are you starting to see those problems materialize now in the face of a stronger dollar, a shutdown in various economies, and a collapse for the backdrop going forward from here? Uh, Look, it's uh, the... The overused term perfect storm does apply because don't forget that underlying as if the coronavirus wasn't big enough, we also have the Saudi-Russia war. Many of these countries are commodity producers, oil producers and commodity producers. So they have, going to your question, a massive shortage of dollars because their exports, the, the, the export values are way down, export volumes are down, and they do have dollar debt. So the expectation that debt servicing uh, and debt and defaults and restructurings are going to be on the rise is is something to, you know, be expected. We thought many people, not including myself, but many people would come on this program, Professor, and question dollar privacy, dollar hegemony <clears throat> in the next economic downturn. Are we finding out that the dollar is the place to be once again, even in this downturn? Well, uh, funny you should mention that Ethan Elsetsky, a former student, Ken Rogoff and I have had several recent pieces on this very issue. And indeed, what we find is that in the 10 years after the 2008-2009 financial meltdown, uh, the dollar gained a lot of ground internationally as the reserve currency for two reasons. One is uh, the euro uh, fell back. 
uh, concerns about its sustainability. Uh, it, it fell back. It, it, and the second is uh, Chinese lending, which was has been massive all over the world, is dollar denominated. So it's Chinese, but it's not in renminbi for the most part. It's in dollars. So it's the dollar, yes, it's the dominant currency and no evidence to the contrary at this stage. So, Professor, but dialing this forward from a market's perspective, dollar-denominated emerging markets debt just had its worst quarter since 1998. Are we going to see more of the same and a rash of defaults that rivals what we saw during the 1980s in Latin America? It's very possible. It's very possible. Now, uh, I, I have been hoping that the international community, the multilaterals with the major government, uh, move towards a uh, a debt standstill, a, you know, a moratorium uh, before the defaults materialize. Because after all, the, everybody's income, this has at the household, at the firm level, at the country level, has been paralyzed. So debt payments should also likewise be temporarily uh, suspended, but absent that, it, it, it's already it's already happening. You're seeing the down the the downgrades in the credit rating agencies with uh, countries moving into junk and near junk uh, status. Carmen, always great to get your thoughts on this program. We appreciate your time this morning. Our thoughts with you and yours. Carmen Reinhardt there, Harvard Kennedy School professor. Emerging markets on the quarter, absolutely vicious. The Brazilian currency down yeah. more than 22%. I, the South African rand down around about the same amount. John, this has been underreported in all the other distractions that we have and our selfishness of looking at our own American geographies. But the flow of money out of EM is jaw-dropping. And it's into just the U.S. Jaw-dropping. dollar. We'll talk about that yeah. a little bit more a little bit later on the program. <clears throat> Equity futures in New York this morning, 95 minutes away from the up and bow. They are negative 11 points. We are down four-tenths of 1% from New York this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. First thing you think of when you hear cancer, that's it. It's finished. All of a sudden your life becomes about appointments and this test and that test. But then you start to just thank God that those tests are there. Every single day, nearly a thousand people find out that they've got cancer. These donations are absolutely crucial for all of the research to help the families like us. Donate right now to Cancer Research UK. For just £2 a month, you can make a real difference. Thank you for your donations. <laughs> You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown to a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling to listen. Not all heroes wear capes, but most wear tights. And here we go, oh, guys, no. underway! Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with the TuneIn Podcast. For expert analysis of the latest WrestleMania, turn on the WWE Podcast. Or listen to the Steve Austin Show for no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities. It's good to be here tonight. It's an empty building. But I'm for these and more, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, I'll talk with our Washington correspondent about the many political battles being waged in the Capitol over how to deal with the new coronavirus. You couldn't imagine a president personalizing a crisis with a virus, but somehow that's, that's where we are. Susan Glasser, listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. 
Competitive managers in the market know with a right partner and a flexible operating platform, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. I'm Steve Meyer, president of SEI's Investment Manager Services. At SEI, we understand the emerging forces that will define success for asset managers and what firms will need to compete tomorrow. That's why we continually optimize SEI's global operating platform. If your business requires greater agility, our advanced technology, integrated best-in-class systems, and multi-asset expertise can be your catalyst for business transformation. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at SEIC.com slash seize change. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Walmart is taking additional steps to protect people during the coronavirus pandemic. The retailer will be taking the temperatures of its employees as they report to work and is in the process of sending infrared thermometers to all of its locations in the next one to two weeks. Walmart is also making masks and gloves available to healthy employees who wish to wear them, but says the masks will not be of the N95 kind, which should be reserved for at-risk healthcare workers. Honeywell is ramping up its manufacturing capabilities in Phoenix to produce N95 face masks. The company says the Phoenix expansion, coupled with previously announced new production in Rhode Island, will allow Honeywell to produce more than 20 million N95 disposable masks monthly. Carnival expects a net loss for fiscal 2020 as the coronavirus coronavirus decimates the cruise business. The company is suspending dividends and buybacks. Meanwhile, Royal Caribbean extended its modified cancellation policy through September 1st. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. If you promise to cover the latest financial and business news from Asia... We're talking about social enterprises in Asian countries. With expert analysts who really understand Asia. Aren't you encouraged with respect to U.S.-China trade? Then you must be us. Tell us about the trend within this part of the world. Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. What sort of fiscal stimulus do you think we'll see? Tonight at 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. We have to get it right the first time. We always talk about the losers in a trade war. You benefit if you're just further away from China. So that you can, too. What are the ramifications if she crumbles or doesn't crumble? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com, and iHeartRadio apps, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Economics. In this cycle, we've dealt with a lot of shocks. It's important to understand what the Fed can and cannot do. Finance. There's no asymmetry left in markets. It truly is a zero-sum game. We will get slower growth. I mean, let's not get confused about that. Investment. Very few investors want to own any energy to begin with. There's a great deal of uncertainty. People are trying to hide in safe places. Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning. Good morning, everyone in Washington and Boston, Bloomberg 1130 in New York, all of you across this nation on Sirius XM Channel 119. We welcome you on all of the digital avenues we have into your home in an isolated and locked down America. Lisa Bramwitz, John Farrow, and Tom Keene, we hope good conversation to get you through this Tuesday and through the week uh, as well. It is extraordinary in New York City. It is a gray cloud, heavy cloud gloomy day and with it are these statistics. John, um, I just looked at John Byrne Murdoch's beautiful work at the FT on New York and on this nation and I'll be direct the curve is not bent not yet but let's hope we get there I'm optimistic, Tom. A lot of people started to do the right thing in places like New York City, yeah. California, and elsewhere as well. There's a big effort now to really flatten that curve. We heard earlier Governor Devine of, uh, of Ohio, and you know those are the kind of people that are just saying, along with Governor Cuomo, let's get this done. Lisa, I look at it almost as an interregnum here to Wednesday ADP, Thursday claims, which will be, I think, still the data item of the week, and then the jobs report on Friday. Yeah, the jobs is really going to be front and center. How bad is it going to be after that record 3.3 million uh, number that we got the jobless file, uh, jobless filings? If that number continues to escalate, can we draw? And John, this actually mm -hmm. goes to a point you've been making. Can we draw the conclusion that the checks in the mail already were way too late, and the carnage, particularly in the retail sector, where we're seeing tons of furloughs, just done? 
Well, I think you can make that argument already. I think you can say that it was late already. Now, yes. is it good that we finally got it? Sure. But the sequencing was always a little bit of a mess. In an ideal world, Tom, what we would, what we would have had was this plant yeah. ready to go before you started to see shutdowns and the huge mitigation effort in places like New York and California. But what happened is it came just a little bit too late and many small and medium-sized enterprises already made the decision to lay people off before the funding, before the aid actually became available. Now let's link that into what we see across this New York and across this nation. I do want to say, folks, on the data, we'll get to that in complete detail. Karen Moscow with our data checks. Oil, a little bit of retail, or a rebound, but ugly, and dollars, some dollar strength today. We'll get to that in a moment. Oliver Chen is in the securities analyst business, one of those wonderful people that not only writes the reports, but actually goes in the stores. He can't go in the stores now. They're all closed. He is with Cowan and joins us today. Oliver, there's an American Eagle two blocks down from our world headquarters. It's closed. How critical is it they open as soon as possible? It's really critical just because the majority of sales still happen in store. So for all these retailers, they're in survival mode because their their number one source of revenue is is at risk and for the foreseeable future. There's so much uncertainty. I mean, the employees furloughed across Macy's Gap and Kohl's. Um, it, it's it's uncertain when stores will open. As we pull executives, it could be four or more months. And our analysis wow. indicates that uh, liquidity is at risk after five. So one in four Americans work in retail, and, and retail really plays wow. an important part in the consumer. Uh, so that this is something we're watching, and we continue to see a bifurcation where uh, people who need household essentials and food and beverages, that's really obviously working. Discretionary purchases are, are less important, and at-home fitness is working too. Oliver, there's a huge amount of confusion, confusion at the moment over whether SMEs who decided to furlough employees before the aid became available from Washington, D.C., whether they're eligible for any of those loans, any of those grants. Um, from the fiscal aid package that went through over last week. Are they? Have you got any clarity on that whatsoever? Yeah, I think as I talk to CEOs and um, my contacts in the business, everybody's analyzing it closely and, and logging on and looking um, with, with no con specific conclusion. So I think it's a, it's a point of transition where, where people are really seeking out what what uh, what's available also uh, when you furlough a worker uh, there's different standards by state regarding unemployment so i, I don't think there's a, a blanket answer regarding um allocating these resources to where they're needed most um to, to be frank and we're just seeing all kinds of different efforts to support workers and and places of business in the time of need more than 500,000. That is the number of furloughed or laid off retail employees in the United States. Big retailers across the board closing down. And I'm looking right now at some of the names. Victoria's Secret. Uh, I'm looking at Gap, Neiman Marcus. I'm struggling to understand how much this entire episode is going to force companies that were already struggling to the break. I mean, how much is just accelerating a process that would have been underway already with some of these struggling retailers versus actually killing really viable and, and strong and, frankly, thriving businesses. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, regarding what's happening next, it's the big getting bigger. So we're moving towards a world of, of Walmart, Target, Amazon, and then me mega players like LVMH. So consolidation is one key theme uh, with, with related M&A of some good brands that aren't necessarily as profitable or at good valuations. Um, two, I think... We'll see store closures and permanent changes in malls. We already had struggling malls. About 25 to 30 percent or more of malls um, are B and C class, and that's a big issue. And then rethinking rent. Um, the, the rent expenses will need to come down, um, and this will a lot depend on the pace of recovery. So going forward, um, we believe stores will be closed until May at least, if not longer, uh, and the pace of the consumer coming back will be a big question mark. Is it V, U, or L? And that will matter uh, for long-term viability. But department stores were already struggling. The big theme I also want to mention is, is curbside pickup and rethinking retail in terms of contactless and what does experiential mean in a contactless world. Yeah. So we've already been seeing the digital innovation with zero checkout and curbside pickup. That's accelerating by a couple of years now. 
Oliver, I want to pick up on the consolidation theme that you talked about. Gap, for example, uh, offered information to employees about getting jobs at Walmart. I'm wondering, I mean, what kind of consolidation? What are some names that you see? I mean, is Walmart going to go by Gap? Anything can happen. I think what we're seeing is, um, you know, Walmart is the biggest grocer, and it also sells lots of soft goods and essentials. Fifty-five percent of the business is grocery, and Amazon grocery and apparel, um, and, and, and rethinking. And Amazon's even interested in luxury goods. So, uh, retail has really been fueled by scale because uh, even before this, the digital investments, the supply chain investments, the need for speed um, has really been the domain and easier for larger players. The artificial intelligence data, uh, rethinking data, um, scale matters for the training models and the algorithms. So that's something to think of, and, and anything can happen. I think every retailer is working together, and this is also a time for the industry to come together uh, to reallocate resources where they're needed. And clearly, um, there's so many stockouts, and labor is necessary as the whole country gets uh, ready. Oliver, I know John wants to take us in a different direction You know, as we look at retail across America. Uh, we had a, a listener uh, call in, Vet Bill, was barking earlier, and Vet Bill wants to know, our dog, wants to know, what are we going to do with Chewy? I mean, Chewy's hugely successful. Is Chewy a no-brainer for Amazon? Well, I think the, the reality is this at-home experience and taking care of your dogs and also health and wellness is a huge theme and rethinking wellness. Um, a, you know, stock we like is Peloton. I was just on the bike and also we're seeing uh, concepts like Neo U. Yeah, I was on the like bike too. Digital <laughs> right, <man. laughs> you, know, and, you know, life will be about um, self-care as well. Out of the, oh, out listen of the to you. <laughs> okay, okay, folks. I just got, we're going to stop the show here. We got time to do this. John, the number one argument of the last three days in our isolation our kingdom of isolation is someone within the house has demanded we get a Peloton. What happens when um, the gym reopens again? That's what I said. Thank you. Thank I mean, you. I think a lot of people think in the <clears throat> same way. One thing that I think might change, yeah. though, Oliver, and it came up in conversations that I was having recently as well, the rush to go to services like Rent the Runway through 2019, where you essentially are sharing clothes with a monthly subscription. Of course, yeah, those clothes point, are cleaned. Yeah. Oliver, many companies were looking at following Rent the Runway's practice through last year and the great success it had. Are we going to start to question that in a massive way as we come through this and come out of it? Well, as we come out of it, I think what will happen is we have a, a consumer that's going to be laser-focused on value. So as you think about rental and um, and what what it can do, as well as re-commerce, it's forty to eighty percent off. So we already had uh, the TJ Maxx's of the world be really successful in taking share from Macy's and full price department stores. But you know, repricing these goods and offering value, of course, the Rent the Runway has a very sophisticated cleaning facility. Right. Uh, and I, I think people will want less stuff. I think people will care about sustainability and the environment and. Everybody's rethought um, what experiential means in terms of uh, staying home and, and spending time with uh, with loved ones and others. Oliver Chen, always great to get your thoughts on a show. Come and see me at Equity Research Analyst on the Retail Outlook and on social distancing. Tom Keen, are you going to get that Peloton or not? No, God, no. You, <laughs> no, you nailed it. You really wondered the gym's about that? Be open. Seriously? Come on, there's a gym. You know, folks, we got down in the basement, down by the furnace, they got a little gym going, you know, with the plates and all. And you know, I was asked the same question the other day. Can we get furnace. a Peloton? We'll put it in the corner. And I said, the gym, we've got a Peloton downstairs in a gym in Whenever the building. It yeah. Whenever it opens. It'll open eventually, <laughs> Lisa. I know, I know. I've got to say, this social isolation, social isolation it's brutal. It is brutal. You start it's to really kind of... It's terrible. It's, it's pretty awful. I, Look, I, I know, I know uh, that we're all doing this tongue-in-cheek, and I will emphasize for our listeners, if you can work at home and you are still being paid, that yeah. is a privilege. There are some people in much, much harder situations Good point. Good point. at the moment in this global economy and in global healthcare. My thoughts are with everyone in the healthcare system working really, really hard right now. And I know our thoughts of the whole team are in the same place as well. Let's get you some headlines, some news worldwide from New York City. Let's say good morning to Michael Barr. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, John. Lisa Tom. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said the number of reported coronavirus deaths in his state shot up 
by 253 in a single day to just over 1,200. Yesterday, the Navy hospital ship, the Comfort, arrived in New York City to help relieve the COVID-19 crisis gripping the city's hospitals. General Terrence O'Shaughnessy is in command of the military efforts to help fight the pandemic and says they are ready to provide relief. You hear the stories of the healthcare workers on the front line, the true heroes of what's going on today. They need relief. They need extra capability. And that's what we brought in with the comfort. And that's what we're bringing in with the Army and Extraordinary Medical Capability that's coming in the Javits Center. So we hear loud and clear that we need help. The federal aspect is, uh, is here. We want to be part of the solution. The ship opens for non-coronavirus cases today. California Governor Gavin Newsom talked about what people should know about social distancing during the pandemic. We just want them physically to create the kind of distance where we can keep other people safe and healthy and all conduct ourselves as if, as if we are positive, even if we haven't gotten the test. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. John Tom Lisa. Michael Barr, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, yeah. as always. One hour and 17 minutes away from the oven and ban in New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. <clears throat> a day of gains. It looked that way for maybe a couple of hours earlier Huge. this morning. Now we're lower by 1% on S&P 500 <laughs> futures. Looking at the bond market with Treasury yields coming in, three bases points to 0.695% on a 10-year. As we round out what feels like the longest Q1 ever in foreign exchange, we yeah. have a day of dollar strength in G10, the dollar stronger against the bulk of the majors. From New York, alongside Lisa Abramitz and Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Farrow. You are listening to Bloomberg Surveillance, and we are live on Bloomberg Radio. <laughs> Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Elite advisory firms rely on BNY Mellon's Pershing to meet the needs of their most complex clients. Karen Novak, Chief Operating Officer at Pershing Advisor Solutions, explains how. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, we bring customized insights and strategies to help you grow your advisory business and stay on the leading edge. We can support the needs of your most sophisticated clients with a full range of investment and wealth management solutions from access to private banking to consolidated bank and brokerage custody. Learn why so many of the largest advisory firms turn to us for the financial strength and high-touch service that BNY Mellon's Pershing can provide. Are you well positioned to stand out from your competition? Learn more at Pershing.com or call 800-445-4467. Brokerage custody provided by Pershing LLC and other services provided by Pershing Advisor Solutions LLC. Both members of FINRA and SIPC. Private banking and bank custody provided by BNY Mellon NA. Member FDIC. Influence. Right now, Talk Talk TV and Vasta Fiber is just £25.50 a month, fixed for 18 months. Plus, you get a year of Amazon Prime on us. Over 80 free view channels, all the on-demand players, and average speeds of 38 megabits per second. Plus, unlimited one-day delivery, thousands of movies, TV shows, and more from Amazon. Massive entertainment package, tiny price. See if you want to spend on popcorn. Search Talk Talk TV. Talk Talk for everyone. Offer ends 22nd of April, subject to availability. T's and C's apply. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. 
Wrapping up here in Moscow, U.S. stock index futures are moving lower, while European stocks have turned lower as well. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. Right now, S&P futures are down 34 points. Dow futures down 273. NASDAQ futures down 75. The DAX in Germany is down 1%. CAC in Paris down 1.5%. And the FTSE 100 down to tenths percent. Ten-year Treasury up 9.30 seconds, yield 0.69%. The yield on the two-year point. Two three percent and the thirty year yields one point three three percent. Nymex crude oil up four percent of eighty one cents at twenty dollars ninety cents a barrel. Comex gold down one and a half percent or twenty four dollars fifty cents at sixteen eighteen seventy an ounce. The euro one point oh nine five three against the dollar. British pound one point two three six one and the yen at one oh eight point five two. The VIX is at fifty eight point four six. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom, John, and Lisa. Karen, thank you, thank you very much. We take stock of an amazing first quarter of 2020, a quarter where the U.S. 10-year yield started the year at around about 192. It is ending the quarter at about 70 basis points. The two-year yield started the year just south of 1.6%, Tom. It is ending the quarter at around about 23 basis points. And I want to go just quickly here before our esteemed guest comes in. John, this is financial repression. It's nominal yield and on an inflation adjusted, the real yield base Basis. It's extraordinary. It's, it, we, we, this is generational. We haven't seen this. What this means for savers, people that just mentally can't be in the market, there can't be enough said about that. We came into March, Tom, with the Fed funds rate at 175. It's now 25 basis yeah. points. We came into March with a balance sheet well south of where it is at the moment, expanding $600 billion just last week at the Fed. And now we've got checks going into the post to everyday yeah. Americans to try and help them get through this. It's a huge reversal in just six yeah. weeks. And, and a quick shout out here to people like Gary Schilling, Stephen Major of HSBC and others that have really led the charge that there would not be high interest rates. Yeah, this is a shock. Yes, it's exogenous. But still, John, the call, the low interest rate call has been an extraordinary multi-decade call. Let's bring in Ira Jersey, shall we, of Bloomberg Intelligence. He heads up our rate strategy here in the United States. Great to catch up with you, Ira. Your take on a phenomenal Q1 for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, <laughs> I think, John, uh, saying it's all the wrong reasons is uh, is an understatement because, you know, we this is in many ways um, much worse than the than the financial crisis of a few, uh, basically a decade ago. And you look at uh, what uh, Tom was talking about with real yields being as low as they are, you have real yields right now for 10-year tips or negative 25 basis points. The last time that you had something like that was 2012 when you had – a massive growth shock going on when um, in uh, places like Europe and and uh, and Asia. So when you when you when you think about what the market's pricing, we're really pricing for an absolutely dismal recovery over the next decade. And it's uh, it's an environment where policymakers are you know throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the problem. But the markets still don't know if, if that's going to be enough, really, to pull the economy back out to some semblance of normal. If we take pride that we don't have negative interest rates, are we just expressing that agony somewhere else? Well, you know, the, having negative interest rates is, you know, it's really an experiment that, you know, places are doing. And, and I, I think my personal opinion is that the experiment hasn't worked very well because the, the idea is, and, and this is always the problem, right? So I know that the tease that Lisa made was, you know, are we going to wind up getting inflation with the Fed's balance sheet more than doubling probably over the next year? It's just, just um, trying to boost ratings. A lot of money in system. <laughs> <laughs> this is what a lot of people are arguing about, actually, right now. Yeah. This is a key well, debate. They, they might be... Yeah, they might be arguing that that this should drive inflation higher, and and they'd all be wrong. Um, so <laughs> we have a con there. You go then. There's a Jersey yeah. charm we love. <laughs> Ira, do you have Ira at your house right now? Do you have is it four or five kids doing uh, online distance learning? Uh, we have well, everyone's doing distance something. So yeah, three, <laughs> three kids and my wife is working remotely as well as I am. So uh, yeah, all of us are social distancing. Well, but so the, the, the well, so let, pick, let me just say up, that, yeah, that pick up on your idea of the fact that this is not going to cause any kind of inflation that we are in a new regime. 
Right. So, so the way that the way that central bank money gets into the system is by people taking out loans. So, in this environment and where people are social distancing, you don't have people taking out a significant amount of loans, and then um, on top of regular everyday economic activity. And that's the that, that's the challenge here because the loans that are going to be made out of, say, the Small Business Administration plan, the the so-called Main Street facility that the Treasury and the Federal Reserve and and the Small Business Administration will be doing, that money is only going to replace. Uh, potential revenue that's revenue lost by those businesses just to keep those uh, businesses from completely going under. So it's not a it's not an enhancement in any way to economic activity, and that's one of the reasons why the the likelihood that you get significant amounts of inflation coming out of this is um, is pretty low. Now, will we get inflation back to you know one or two percent, which is certainly what the market's pricing? I mean, the ten year ten year inflation break evens right now are only uh, are only ninety five basis points. So we're we're expecting for the next ten year years inflation to only average one percent. Now, a big part of that is things like energy prices. But when you back out even um, energy prices, you look at what core inflation, so this is inflation excluding food and energy prices, you're still only talking about probably 2% um, inflation over the next decade in uh, at the core level, which is fine. And we hope that we get back there. And, and that's, I think, what the market's trying to grapple with is, will we get back to a, where we were a year ago, um, a year from now? And um, it, it's not obvious that that's where, um, where we're going to be able to go with, you know, equity futures now, you know, down another, you know, half a percent while we're speaking. It, it's clear that people aren't sure what the profit, uh, what profit and the economy is going to look like. And it's, it's a scary situation for a lot of people. All right, we have 30 seconds, so please keep this short. But you said something earlier in the conversation I want to pick up on. You said the balance sheet, the Fed will double by the end of the year. It expanded $600 billion last week alone. By the end of this year, just how much of this market is this Fed going to own? Yeah, so, well, the, the, uh, well, the thing is the market's getting much larger, right? So uh, particularly the Treasury market. So the, the Treasury market is, is likely to go up um, about $1.5 trillion um, by the end of the year. A lot of that's in T-bills, but um, you, you, the Fed will be buying a large portion of that. Will they, you know, will they, is it going to buy all of it? No, but they will own a lot of the market when this is all said and done. Ari Jersey, great to get you on the program. Bloomberg wow. Intelligence is chief U.S. race strategist. Some crazy numbers out there at the moment, Tom. They are. That's, a, that's exactly the right phrase here on March 31. It is crazy. And, John, what's so important, none of this has been framed. It was, it's truly unimaginable, some of those you know, big $600 billion numbers we're talking about. Well, it's happening. It's something you've got to get your hands around because it's happening and it's already happened. Looking at the equity market to Iris Point, we roll over. We are down by 1.24% on the S&P 500 this morning alongside Lisa Abravitz. Apply and privacy terms can be found at bevel.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. Hey y'all, Jeff Foxworthy here. Now if you've ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over for 75 years, you might be... Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. That's why I'm filling in for Smokey to switch things up. Because there's a lot more to say. And I should know because my grandfather was a firefighter. And one of the things he taught me is that the people that love the outdoors the most are often the ones accidentally starting wildfires. Which means always (laughs) B-Y-O-B. No, 
bring your own bucket to the campfire. And be extra careful with things like burning yard trimmings. Don't just walk away, or chances are you might be starting a wildfire. So for the love of the outdoors, go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. For centuries, Welsh farmers have been perfecting the balance between maintaining the spectacular landscapes of Wales while producing delicious lamb and beef. Lucky for us, we have everything we need from the elements. Grass, rainwater, and a whole lot of pride. Sustainability is key as we continue to work in harmony with our surroundings to bring you a plate that's uniquely Welsh. It's in the taste. Learn more at eatwelshlamandwelshbeef.com. Did you know that Players of People's Postcode Lottery have raised over £500 million for charities and good causes? They've also won £47 million in prizes so far this year. And it could be your postcode next. Visit postcodelottery.co.uk forward slash radio before midnight on the 23rd of April to play in the May draws. PPL manage lotteries on behalf of good causes. 16 plus, conditions apply, play responsibly. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night. Somehow, I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> it was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here. Testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Witch.co.uk Our tests find you the best. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet, about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Apply by the 31st of March for a chance to win your first year in halls. Visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. For our audience worldwide, we are live on Bloomberg Radio, where equity futures are just off session lows, but still negative nine-tenths of one percent. Sixty minutes away from the opening bell in your bond market, a state of play as follows for treasuries in the United States of America, starting the year at 192 on a 10-year, ending the first quarter at around about 69 basis points. Your data for the week ahead, light on the data front today. Tomorrow, you will get an ISM manufacturing number out of the United States, together with ADP employment change. Thursday, Tom, initial jobless claims. This Friday, payrolls Friday, just around the corner. Can we mention something, John, end of quarter we haven't mentioned yet? I know you're going to wander off and uh, do the open on television. The VIX is 57.74, and that's some sense of stability. We should be thankful it's not 80. I I think that's the story. (laughs) It's extraordinary. I mean, you know, you look for folks for range and scope from January. First, I went back and actually looked at the 1231 headlines. Uh, Angela Merkel was talking about climate change at the time. Uh, things have changed in 90 days, to say the least. Let us do this. Let's begin our labor analysis. Normally, folks, we really wouldn't do this on a Tuesday, but we're going to do it today, break the rules. With Julia Coronado, macro policy perspectives quoted, I believe, in the Washington Post lead article this morning on the American economy. Julia, good morning. Uh, what number do we expect Thursday on claims? Is it a guess, or can you come up with some form of statistic? Well, it's a guess. Uh, it's, it is the leading indicator. So all we're basing it on is um, the reports that we're getting from individual states. But it looks like we're going to have another record-breaking number. So the 3.2 million last week is not a one-off. We're probably going to see another maybe 2 million in claims this week. Um, and that's going to translate into 
many millions uh, loss of payrolls in the April report. Not the report due out this Friday, but the following report that comes in early May. Julia, the expectations are getting increasingly dire. Goldman Sachs came out with a forecast uh, a couple weeks ago saying the U.S. will shrink by an annualized 24 percent in the second quarter. Now coming out saying it's going to be 34 percent and saying unemployment will soar to 15 percent by mid-year. What are you right. looking for in the data to either confirm that dire view or that perhaps gives you a sense of what we're looking at? So claims is, is probably one of the more reliable indicators we have right now and, and timely. Uh, so I think how high it goes and how persistent that is. Um, obviously, in this episode, we're bringing forward a contraction um, in a really unusual way. Um, so the duration of this matters a lot. And then how much it spills over from the immediately impacted sectors, hotels, restaurants, uh, the travel industry into other sectors uh, is something that we're going to be watching for. So high frequency indicators are much more valuable uh, than than usual in the current context. You say bringing forward a contraction, and when people talk about how unusual this is, a forced shutdown in order to fight a pandemic, do we have any sense or are the numbers going to give us any clues as to how quickly some of these people can get their jobs back? You know, it really is going to be uh, dependent on how effective all of these stimulus measures are. So I think with the $2 trillion and the $4 trillion uh, in, in fiscal uh, stimulus and the $4 trillion in lending capacity at the Fed, how quickly can that get out the door? How much, how effectively does that serve as a bridge loan for businesses so that they can stay in business and restart operations in a timely way? Um, I don't think it's going to be a V. Uh, the shutdowns may start to end, but then I think we're going to resume normal activity very cautiously and gradually. Um, so I think it's going to be more of a U. Um, once we really get to uh, address this virus and test and develop a uh, vaccine, then we can really resume activity with, con with confidence, and that probably won't be till next year. Judy, on a program like this, we're really fortunate to have one of the most sophisticated, smart audiences I think there is anywhere in the world of media worldwide on a program like Bloomberg Surveillance. But we have a broader audience when things get stressful in markets and we have the kind of drawdown we've had over the last couple of weeks. And I think we need to do a better job of trying to translate what the Fed is actually doing. So a headline just crossed the Bloomberg just moments ago, and I'll read it out verbatim. It said, the Fed is launching a temporary repo facility with foreign central banks. The facility mm -hmm allows central banks to repo treasuries for dollars. The facility is an alternative dollar source to selling securities. Can you translate what they're doing for a much wider audience and why they're doing what they're doing? So um, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Um, it's um, how we uh, engage in international trade. It's, it's contracted and executed in dollars. So what we often see in a crisis is that there's a shortage of dollars globally. Um, a lot of borrowing and commerce and investing is done in dollars. Uh, and when you have a dollar crunch like that, it can turn from, you know, a recession or a contraction in activity into a financial crisis very quickly um, because the dollar shortage can trigger defaults and uh, deleveraging. So I think this is what the Fed is trying to address by providing that dollar liquidity uh, through global central banks. We did that with the swap lines. Now we're doing it with repo. Um, so I think it's, again, trying to short circuit this, what is clearly going to be a deep and painful recession from becoming a full-blown financial crisis. And that's been the objective of all of these um, various activities that the Fed has been engaged in. And to follow on from John's well-framed question, Dr. Coronado, is the idea here is to get out in front of crisis. And as we've all studied, that crisis comes from emerging markets. Are, are we at a point where the emerging markets in dollar shortage are so fragile and they don't have the power against the great reserve currency that they're going to need IMF assistance soonest? Um, more than likely, we will see some countries in that level of distress. Um, again, I think that the Fed has been very aggressive very early, so that was one of the lessons learned from 2008. You don't hold your ammunition back, um, and I think that will help. 
Um, uh, but nonetheless, I think we're already seeing signs of distress. And, um, you know, the, the, this is unfolding with unprecedented speed. Uh, so, you know, whereas, as you were saying earlier, Tom, just a few months ago, the picture looked pretty benign. Um, boy, have things changed. And so um, I think even some of all of these efforts um, aren't likely to be universally effective in, in preventing all distress. There will be distress in some countries. And back in the U.S., there's a question about the world's largest economy and the safety net that the consumer had, the strong consumer, uh, where some reports, towards the stock of Deutsche Bank in particular, are coming out and saying they don't have $600 on average to cover an emergency, and people are looking to the April 1st rent, uh, which may or may not get paid. Do you have a sense of just the sort of resources of the consumer right now, how strong the household balance sheet is heading into this? Well, I think this is where the distribution of income is relevant. Um, we households have strong balance sheets, but th those strong balance sheets are concentrated at the high end of the income spectrum. Meanwhile, it is the lower end of the income spectrum that is most vulnerable and experiencing the greatest job losses. So um, many households, most households don't even have $400 set aside okay. for an emergency. Wilson, um, Lisa, so those, so those households can't pay rent on April 1st. Lisa, I'm so glad you brought this up, but Dr. Coronado, you go right to the heart of the matter. Everyone listening to this, to this show, with or without means, maybe they have family members that can't get that $400 of that rent check for April. Why is our politics pussyfooting around with an alphabet soup of politically generated programs? What we need yeah. is yeah. massive income yeah. substitution. Yes, abs you're absolutely right, Tom, and some other countries have been much more aggressive on that front, providing rent and mortgage payment holidays for their consumers for a number of months. That is what you need to bridge uh, this cash crunch for consumers, uh, and we have not well, seen that kind come of effort. On, you're Julia, you're a huge student of history on this. Where where did this come from? Is this some Lockean Calvinist ethos from the 19th century? Is it some uh, pseudo-Victorian psychology? People, and, uh, I mean, folks, this is Republicans and Democrats. They got to pay the rent. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't, I can't explain the political rationale for this, Tom. Um, and even the Fed has it in its power to be more aggressive on this front. They could mandate, uh, a, they have issued supervisory guidance to banks to encourage forbearance and um, payment holidays. They could be a little bit more forceful on that front and really find a way to finance a payment holiday for agency mortgages and sort of mandate it for the banks and figure out the financing uh, that's required. I think we could see a stronger effort from the Fed to set the standard there uh, and get that, use the financing in a creative way to address that cash crunch. Uh, and I hope that's the direction they, they start to go in, because uh, it certainly is within their power. Julia, thank you. And thank you for your contribution this you. morning. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. We really appreciate it. Julia Coronado there, Macro Policy Perspectives founder and president as well. Let's get you some news, some headlines worldwide. We can do that by checking in with Michael Bark. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, John. Lisa Tom. Coronavirus deaths jumped by a record number in Spain. Spain and Italy were still struggling to avoid the collapse of their health systems, with Spain saying hospitals in at least half of its 17 regions are at or very near their ICU bed limits. Spain also has more than 10,000 infected medical workers. Today, the World Health Organization warned that the pandemic was also far from over in Asia. In the U.S., New York Governor Andrew Cuomo begged for health care reinforcement, saying up to one million more workers were needed. Two governors, one Republican and one Democrat, are spelling out what states need from the federal government to fight the coronavirus in a letter to the Washington Post. Bloomberg's Martin DeCarroll reports. 
Maryland Governor Larry Hogan and Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer topped their list of must-haves by imploring FEMA to better coordinate the distribution of critical supplies based on need. Hogan says there are still not enough test kits or ventilators to name two. The president has said the states, you know, are sort of on their own. They're up to, they should go out and get these things, and we all are trying to get them. But the federal government is also in the private sector trying to purchase those same things. Whitmer's co-authorship is notable because President Trump has repeatedly insulted her because she criticized the uncoordinated federal response. In Washington, Martin DeCaro, Bloomberg Radio. President Trump is expected to relax Obama-era vehicle mileage standards. The rule expected to be announced today would gut one of the nation's single biggest efforts against climate change. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. John, Tom, Lisa. Michael Barr, thank you very much, sir. Michael Barr there with the news, the headlines from New York City. Here is your price action. Equity futures are lower by 25 points on the S&P 500. In foreign exchange, the Fed's stepping back in, but the dollar still stronger against the bulk of G10. We have had some massive moves in FX through the first quarter, Tom, and not just in emerging markets, but in G10 as well. The moves on the Aussie, the moves on British yeah. power, the sterling price has just been all over the place. Yeah, well, Sterling, as I was going to mention, but what's fascinating to me, John, is how Euro-Yen, take out the dollar, has just pivoted around 119. It's amazing the, the pull, the tug of Euro versus Yen uh, through all this. Been really quite stable compared to what else yeah. we've seen, particularly on the growthier names like the Australian dollar, which has just the been hammered ones. through yes. 2020. From New York this morning, good morning to all alongside Lisa Abramitz and Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together, we make Bloomberg surveillance and we are live on Bloomberg Radio with your bond market advancing and yield to lower by three basis points. Your yield on a 10 year 0.7%. This is your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise Pellegrini. A lot of folks are fretting over what happens at the start of April. That's when the rent is due and $81 billion in rent is due, as a matter of fact. And many renters are warning they won't be paying this time around. And many local governments have placed temporary bans on evictions because of coronavirus. CoStar Group says more than 25% of households renting in the U.S. may need help because of coronavirus and need a total of up to $12 billion a month in government support. On top of this, there is a growing sense among landlords that even tenants who can afford to pay may not write the check this time around because they just don't have to. All this has property owners scrambling to come to some type of arrangement with their lenders. The apartment industry alone has more than one and a half trillion dollars in outstanding debt. And residential landlords aren't the only ones worried either. Commercial landlords may also find themselves in a bind. And that's your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise Pellegrini. 25 years ago, NJIT graduate Dick Sweeney co-founded Keurig Green Mountain, a company whose incredible innovations changed the way the world brews a cup of coffee. Today, he lectures widely on business leadership and is a strong advocate for NJIT's work to combine business education with the power of STEM. NJIT is definitely fostering the innovative thinking for budding entrepreneurs simply because that's the world we live in. NJIT is producing students that have been trained, educated, and given the business acumen to be a contributor to a company. The distinct mission is to develop great STEM scholars. The attributes I've always looked for in team members are heart, smarts, guts, and luck. So we want people with passion, intelligence, courage, and never discount luck. The student coming out of NJIT has, uh, has experienced all of that. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. I love dogs and cats. Short-haired, long-haired. I love you all, don't I, Bianca? But I don't love cat hair all over my carpet, which is why I got a job testing vacuum cleaners in the Witch Test Lab. We rub an exact amount of real pet hair into an exact area of real carpet to see which vacuum cleaners really suck it up. And the vacuums that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your home. Witch.co.uk. Our tests find you the best. At Dell, when we created the new XPS 13 laptop, we treated every little piece like it was everything. We crafted every part 
as if it were the most important thing we'd ever made. The result? Something you'll have to see to believe. Pity this is radio. See the new award-winning Dell XPS 13 at dell.co.uk. Every little thing is everything. On this week's On the Media, we are awash in messages, but some messengers are more effective than others. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. Meanwhile, some media outlets choose not to air the president's press briefings live, and media critics ponder what's the right balance between good information and all information. All that and more on this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. U.S. stock index futures are slipping, and European shares are bursting in advance as investors debate whether the market meltdown has ended, given the continued spread of the coronavirus. Right now, S&P futures are down about 28 points. Dow futures down 214. NASDAQ futures down at 63. The stocks Europe 600 has turned higher once again, but the DAX in Germany is lower. It's down half percent, while the CAC in Paris is down 7 tenths percent, and the FTSE 100 is up 2 tenths of a percent. Ten-year Treasury up 9.30 seconds, yield 0.69 percent. The yield on the two-year, 0.23 percent. Nymex crude oil is up almost 4 percent, up 79 cents at $20.88 a barrel. Comex gold is down 1.3 percent. On twenty-one dollars twenty cents at sixteen twenty-two an ounce, the euro at one point oh nine seven zero against the dollar. British pound one point two three seven nine, and the yen at one oh eight point three five. And the Federal Reserve said it has opened a temporary repurchase agreement facility for foreign central banks to support the smooth functioning of financial markets. The program will allow participants to temporarily exchange U.S. Treasuries for dollars, which can then be made available to institutions in their jurisdictions. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Lisa. I wonder if the catalyst for that was the oil price. We will see. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keene with us. You know, Tuesday, uh, gray clouds over New York and Lisa. Weather on the west side, the upper west side, or the upper east side. It's all the same. Children cheating in their online distance <laughs> learning classroom. There yes. were reports in the New York Times in the second section, folks, page five, that selected urchins on the Upper West Side were listening to music during math class. Oh yes, that, yes. There, there, there was, there did was. Did you hear a bit reports of, of this? I, I did hear reports of this, and I, I wasn't sure <clears> what to do, so I just closed the door and made more muffins and hoped for the best. I will say, you know, we do joke uh, about the situation, and it's sort of this really tenuous balance between yeah. trying to have humor and the reality of exactly. the situation. And I will say, yeah. you know, things can feel sort of normal, and then you walk by those tents in Central Park that are being set up for the overflow patients uh, from Mount Sinai. And, and you see, you know, you hear the sirens. And I got to say, there is a feeling that is just so yeah. overwhelming in this city right yeah. now. Looking down on those tents right now from where I live, folks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven large tents and about another six small tents, electric generators outside. I saw a group of people with masks on outside the lead tent uh, this morning, Lisa, before they went in. I haven't seen any medical uh, movement yet. They're still in the construction phase, we believe, ready to go with that uh, on the on the east lawn of the Central Park uh, today. This outside the I Center at Mount uh, Sinai. Just to finish up the thought, Lisa, uh, there's a report of a child on the Upper East Side caught playing Minecraft Bed Wars uh, <laughs> this morning, somewhere yeah. in the vicinity of Mrs. Lerner's science lecture. Well, distance learning is turning <clears throat> into distance cheating, distance listening to music, it's and distance Minecraft for sure. <laughs> just appalling that, that this was caught, and uh, she's been sequestered with vet bill in the King Jail. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of sequestered, we're all sequestered in our view of the market, seguing as we can to Marcus Ashworth in London, who has been just brilliant on synthesizing the emotion of participating. Marcus, what's the mood now in terms of, as John Farrell mentioned earlier, this big drawdown? Is there an enthusiasm to go out and buy the dip, or are people benumbed? I think there's, there's definitely, uh, how can we say this, horses for courses. Uh, 
high quality stuff. Uh, we saw some great, excellent demand going through, uh, um, you know, corporate bonds, uh, it's investment grade. Um, that's been clearly doing very well, both sides of the pond, U.S. and Europe. Um, less so in investment, uh, sub-investment, junk, junk quality markets. It's a lot of real, real worries about the CLO and uh, commercial mortgage banks, things like that. So it very much depends on the, uh, where the, the help is coming, government um, and central bank stimulus is coming into um, liquid markets and, and not illiquid, I'm afraid. Marcus, I'm curious how much of what we're seeing in terms of the some slight rebound, I don't want to say full rebound by any means or stretch of the imagination, but a uh, slight rebound that we're seeing in credit markets, how much of that is purely tied to what you say, which is central banks backstopping and buying uh, those securities versus actual realization that with ongoing credit, these companies will survive? In other words, are people still ignoring the fundamentals? Oh, that's a tricky question. Um, and the answer, again, is part, part yes, part no. I mean, you know, I don't think any of us believe that this, this, is, this is over fully yet. Um, and a lot of people obviously <laughs> expecting that normally how these, these things go, there'll be another sickening lurch lower at some point before we can fully say a, a bottom is in. But there's no doubt about it. There is demand coming <clears throat> flooding back. Uh, and, and, you know, some quite sort of spicy uh, names like Carnival Cruise Company are, are, are testing their, their arm uh, out in, uh, in the bond markets. And there's been some pretty good demand so far. InBev came with a big deal yesterday. <clears throat> she's built Monster Hunt for Oracle. Um, and it's, it's, it's feeding through in all, 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 all manners of, uh, you know, the banks came last week with some very generous terms which clearly allow them to then extend all these revolving credit facilities, which a lot of corporates need. Yeah. We're seeing T-Mobile doing a big deal. That they're taking down their, their revolving credit facility. They will then place bonds when they can. That's how banking systems should work. So that's, there's some good news in there. Uh, Mark Sashworth, quickly here, what, is the, what are the signals for equity investors when they see this kind of bond market activity? Well, there's a direct correlation between credit spreads and equities. Usually, um, a lot of these things have broken down. <laughs> uh, lots of relationships have gone, have gone a bit weird. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think as far as equity markets are concerned, they should take solace in the fact that um, clearly a lot of forward spending plans will be cut back, which is great in some sense of support for the share prices. But the fact that, that uh, banks, corporates, uh, and, you know, even not quite into high yield yet, but certainly lower grade, triple B uh, investment grade companies can borrow and borrow large, and there is strong demand there. Must be a good sign for, that there is a forward, a healthy sign for the economy, and I think that's something which the equity people are, are starting to take wider solace to the fact that the debt capital markets are open. It's got to be good news for forward business. Marcus Ashworth, a Bloomberg Opinion columnist, thank you so much for joining us there from London. And I will just say, Tom, looking at the move in the quarter, just shocking to see how much borrowing costs increased for companies around the world. I mean, doubling, tripling, uh -oh. if you look at the high yield and the investment grade universe. Yeah, I'd, bring it over, yeah, I'd bring it over to equities, lease as well. And you could have a large cap love fest, things that are solid, that blue chippy, if you will. Lisa, the phrase blue chip is a phrase from another time and place think you know yeah blue chippy be in particular time very blue she got i feel old folks anyways very blue chippy and you really wonder what small cap does here and of course that's always the bet of the market yeah well if you take a look for example high yield bond spreads the extra yield that investors demand to own this credit over benchmark rates nine percentage points that's up from wow 3.3 percent at the end of last year <clears throat> oh, just extraordinary right now top of the hour Trying to get to the market opening futures at negative 25, Dow futures negative 187. Worldwide, this is Bloomberg. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, I'll talk with our Washington correspondent about the many political battles being waged in the Capitol over how to deal with the new coronavirus. You couldn't imagine a president personalizing a crisis with a virus. But somehow that's that's where we are. Susan Glasser. Listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you, I beg you to come down here right now. 
Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong with Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. March 31st, 2004, New York Yankees starter Kevin Brown becomes only the second pitcher in MLB history to have beaten all 30 teams. Got him over the outside corner. An 11 strikeout night for Kevin Brown. They win it on the arm and of Kevin Brown here tonight. Overwhelming performance by Brown. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Ford has canceled plans to restart factories in Mexico and the U.S. over the next couple of weeks citing risks to workers posed by the coronavirus. The United Auto Workers had expressed concern about going back to work when Ford said last week it would begin to restart factories. Ford still plans to begin producing ventilators at a Michigan factory toward the end of April. Kohl's, Macy's, and its Bloomingdale stores, along with Gap, have now joined the growing number of retailers halting pay for much of their workforce while preserving some benefits. With these furloughs, that brings the total number of employees who are out of paycheck at major U.S. chains to more than 500,000. Spirit Airlines is temporarily suspending service at five airports in the Northeast until at least early May because of travel advisories aimed at curbing the spread of coronavirus. The pause begins this week at New York City's LaGuardia and New Jersey's Newark Liberty International, followed by a halt in service at Hartford, Connecticut, Niagara Falls, and Plattsburgh, New York. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. They don't just talk to the most important people. Can you give us your broad sense of the main driver behind the latest weakness? They talk with the most interesting people. When you talk to your clients, are they taking this seriously? Lisa Abramowitz. What's going to be the main driver of growth? Paul Sweeney. What did you take away from those Amazon numbers last night? Bloomberg Markets. Is it as ominous this time around? Weekday mornings at 10 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. We have to get it right the first time. We always talk about the losers in a trade war. You benefit if you're just further away from China. So that you can, too. What are the ramifications if she crumbles or doesn't crumble? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com, and iHeartRadio apps, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Economics. We are being taken out of our comfort zone by the coronavirus. Solar weakness is pretty much a good thing for a lot of the rest of the world. Finance. We are going to see a global demand contraction this year, most likely, for oil. The financial health of the business sector has deteriorated somewhat. Investment. Obviously, the value in high vol stocks are going to continue to suffer. It looks as though the bond market is talking itself into a recession here. Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. It is the end of a quarter. It has been an extraordinary, uh, just an absolutely stunning first quarter of 2020. 
2020, we are all stunned with market losses that we've seen. And, of course, a few really making all sorts of money in equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. We welcome all of you uh, here. The virus update, without any question, is grim in Spain and Italy. Uh, some of the extensions in the United States of all these charts and equations we have of this pandemic, uh, really, really not very good. Tom Keene and Paul Sweeney uh, with you this morning. Paul, the end of the quarter is always a, an important point. The big move in the markets yesterday, was that proverbial window dressing? How do you translate that? Yeah, interesting, Tom. We've, you know, we've kind of bounced off the low here, but I'm not hearing anybody saying uh, that we've seen the low. Maybe we're starting to form a bottom a little bit, but uh, I've also heard a lot of strategists say, don't be surprised if we retest the lows when a lot of the economic data and the earnings data uh, come in over the next uh, several weeks. Part of that data, before we get to David Wilson here, part of that data data is the labor data. It begins with ADP. Uh, I thought that um, High Frequency Economics had a great essay on their U.S. team, uh, Rania Fruer, uh, the, the idea that ADP really won't be uh, informative, that it's enough dated material where it's before the crisis. But boy, Paul, that claims number that we're going to see on Thursday could be frightful. It really could be, Tom. We had 3.28 uh, million last week, and uh, you know, I don't think uh, you know we're going to get some more really grim data yeah. uh, coming up. And uh, of course, I think the investors really need to brace for that. I'm sure they are really bracing for that really over the next several weeks and months. Jobs Day on Friday as well. Right now, on an end of the quarter, equity market analysis, I'm gasping, as is everybody else with <clears throat> drawdowns. Here's David Wilson. David, what do you have? Well, we got to start with Carnival. The shares are down 13.5% in early trading. It's the most active stock at the moment. The cruise line owner is raising $6 billion by selling three-year notes, convertible debt, and shares. Carnival suspended dividends and stock buybacks and forecast a loss for this year because of the coronavirus. And actually, before today, Carnival down about 75% for the quarter. So you're talking about a bigger decline uh, coming up. And you look at Carnival's peers, they're lower in today's trading. Royal Caribbean down about 5.5%. Norwegian lower by 2.5%. Contrast that with what's going on with the airlines. They're higher. American up 3.5%. CEO Doug Parker told employees that the carrier will apply for about $12 billion of U.S. government aid from an economic rescue package passed last week. American agreed to pay partial salary for employees taking voluntary leave or early retirement, so they're sweetening the deal. And then you look across uh, American's peers, you see Delta up about 1%, Southwest up half a percent, United also up half a percent. And the oil stocks are higher, too. Uh, you've got uh, crude coming up from an 18-year low in New York trading, back above $20 a barrel. You know, yesterday, it's got as low as 1927. So you're looking wow. at Exxon Mobil up 2%, Occidental Petroleum up 4%, and oil services Halliburton up 4.5%. Abbott Labs up 3%. The medical product maker was hired for a second day after introducing a coronavirus test that can provide results in as little as five minutes. Now, Abbott climbed yesterday by 6.4%. Then you have Delphi Technologies. The shares are taking a beating in early trading, and here's why. Uh, a $1.5 billion takeover of the auto parts maker by Borg Warner hit a snag. Borg Warner said it may pull out of the deal because Belfi, Delphi borrowed the full $500 million available from a revolving credit facility without its permission. Delphi shares down more than 27% wow. in early trading. Gap slower by 2.5%. The apparel retailer is putting most U.S. and Canadian employees on furlough as stores remain closed. Gap's reducing corporate staff and top managers are taking temporary pay cuts. You also have furloughs coming at department store chains, Kohl's and Macy's, and their shares are lower too. Kohl's down about 2% and Macy's down 1.5%. But i got to talk about Domino's Pizza. It's the one restaurant chain that has a gain this year in all of S&P's <laughs> main indexes. S&P 500, mid-cap 400, small-cap 600. The shares are down about 6.5% today. Domino's withdrew its annual forecast and borrowed all the $158 million available through a note program. They basically said they can't quantify all the effects that the coronavirus is having on their business. And you look at Papa John's, one of their biggest rivals. Well, those shares...
are down too. They're lower by about two and a half percent in early trading. Bloomberg Stocks Editor Dave Wilson, thank you so much. Brilliant there. Yeah. I'm stunned that the pizza companies were doing so well. Yeah, ex- exactly. I see them running around here. Um, it, yeah. You know, Tom, we've got earnings coming out and, you know, starting in a couple, three weeks. And, uh, you know, I think uh, folks are going to be spending more time focusing, not so much on the earnings because we know they're going to be grim, but really on some of the balance sheet issues, debt, liquidity, pension obligations, things like that, uh, to mm-hmm. get a sense of kind of what's going on there. We welcome our good friend Amanda I- Cone, Bloomberg Taxes Financial Accounting Reporter. Amanda, thanks so much for joining us. So talk to us a little bit about some of the balance sheet issues that you think investors will be or should be looking at this coming earnings season. Absolutely. Glad to be here, guys. Thank you for having me. Look, it's all about the cash right now. Just listening to the markets report we just heard, it's all about um, freeing up cash. How much cash do they have in the bank? Do they have short-term credit lines that companies can draw down on? Are they going to be cutting dividends? Are they furloughing staff? You mentioned safeties and coals. That all frees up cash. It's all about who has enough money on hand to endure the crisis and have a shot at serving customers again on the other side of all this, right? So investors are already looking at balance sheets, right? These are a, a snapshot in time of the assets and obligations that our company has. Yeah. Right? The most recent data we have is from December. And so that's really what investors are working off. I mean, projections for growth, revenue growth. I mean, everyone's had to just tear those projections okay, up but and start if, from scratch. Amanda, if they need more cash... Do they just go out and get it for equity? I mean, I mean, uh, David Wilson mentioned Carnival with their horrific story of the past 60 days. Forget about Carnival. A regular American company, is it so dire that they're going to rekindle short-term paper by diluting equity? Look, it, it's an option if they have to do that. Um, obviously, companies are considering that option. I mean, it, it, it's sort of all hands on deck, no pun intended, uh, talking about a cruise ship company. But they're looking to ride out this crisis, <laughs> and they don't know how long it's going to last, right? Timing here is critical. You know, you might be able to continue to pay your leases on, on equipment and facilities. You might be able to continue to pay if yeah. aren't working, but do you have enough cash to pay debt that's coming yeah. through this year and next? Those are some of the well, that, those are some of the factors that investors are considering yeah. right now. Paul, should we sign Amanda up? I missed that pun. She killed that. Killed it. I mean, <laughs> exactly. All, all hands, hands on deck. Well, I don't mean that's, that's, that's not funny, but all hands on deck. Carnival Cruise, did you get that? Did you I got that. You know? That was perfect. <laughs> this is slick, I tell you. Exactly. So, Amanda, what are some of the things that you think investors should be looking at? Cause, you know, a lot of times we don't really think about some of the... Uh, liabilities, you know, other than just, gee, gee, what's your long-term debt? What are some other things that investors will be likely looking at as they think about liquidity for these companies? So, you know, another area are lease liabilities, right? Remember all those airplanes and warehouses and office space that came on the balance sheet last year. Investors now have a full year of lease liability data to factor into um, their models. Look, uh, Cheesecake Factory last week announced they weren't going to pay rent in April, right? That's a, a major expense for them. It's a major long-term liability. So that's one area that investors are looking at. Intangible assets is in us. And other companies are likely going to be evaluating whether or not they need to write down the value of those assets. And they're t- doing that analysis now. And so if they write down the assets, yeah. they still might owe debt on that acquisition, whether it was an intellectual property or a brand. They still, if they took on debt to buy that property, they still owe on the debt. So um, well. those are just a few examples. All right. This has been Bruce, way too much accounting for Tuesday morning. Amanda, I come. thank you so much. All I can tell you, Amanda, is one of the intangibles is my ability to consume key lime pie cheesecake at Cheesecake Factory. We thank Amanda Iacone for reminding us the Cheesecake Factory is closed, as are too many others this morning. She's with Bloomberg Tax Reporter. Paul, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really deep in the weeds, some of that accounting, and that's the professional nature of what Bloomberg Law and Bloomberg Tax does. But, Paul, these are serious questions. They are, Tom. I think the uh, I think a lot of the conversations we're going to hear on some of these earnings calls is in addition to, geez, what is the outlook for your business and um, is just really 
walk us through the liquidity that you have uh, in your company on your balance sheet, yeah. um, and you know what's your cash situation, your cash burn. You're going to have that. We're going to hear a lot about cash burn, Tom, and you know how much liquidity the companies have and how yeah. long can they go uh, with you know a very uh, challenged revenue environment of every company in this yeah. America right now. With our news in New York City, we welcome Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Paul. The world total climbed to more than 800,000 cases of COVID-19. Healthcare workers are under immense stress on the front lines in the war against the coronavirus. Jack Chapman is a New York City paramedic who has been responding to 911 calls. I think people need to understand that there is no one that's exempt from this virus. It's hitting all age groups, all ethnicities, all backgrounds. Unfortunately, there's no rhyme or reason that we know of to who's getting it worse than others. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo begged for health care reinforcement, saying up to a million more workers were needed. A legal battle over abortions during the coronavirus pandemic continues in Texas. The state's attorney general claims the procedure is not essential and uses up vital resources to fight the virus. Federal judges in Ohio, Texas, and Alabama have blocked orders banning non-essential medical procedures from limiting abortion access during the coronavirus outbreak. A win for abortion rights activists. A Tampa, Florida pastor has been charged after he continued to host large church services despite public orders urging residents to stay home to help contain the spread of the virus. Hillsborough County Sheriff Chad Cronister said Pastor Rodney Howard Brown has been charged with two counts, unlawful assembly and a violation of health emergency rules. There were more than 400 people gathered, and he not only put their lives at risk, not those hundreds of parishioners, parishioners, but how about the thousands of people in the Tampa Bay area community that are now at risk as these parishioners return back to their neighborhoods? Florida has more than 5,200 confirmed coronavirus cases. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg Tom. Uh, Michael Barr, thank you so much. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen. Very quickly here, Paul, as we get to the market opening this final day of this first quarter of 2020, what do institutions do here? Do they dress to get cash down? How does that work, Paul? Yeah, Tom, I think I think what we're seeing across the board and across a number of industries is companies really trying to get the liquidity that they can, you know, just kind of really hunkering down here. So drawing down their credit lines, uh, pulling down, you know, uh, all liquidity that they have, really taking a look at their working capital as well, and really trying to hunker down and uh, you know preserve as much cash uh, as, as possible. Because you just don't know, Tom. You just don't know how disrupted and how long the disruption will last. At worst, the VIX in the 80s, it comes into the 60s, and now a better VIX, 56, 56. Point six one futures and negative fourteen. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Imagine, imagine being denied an apartment because of your religion or your race or because you have children or a disability. It's so wrong. Yes, but who has the power to stop this? You do. Each of us has the power. The law is on your side. It's illegal for landlords to discriminate because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or familial status. If you suspect that you have experienced housing discrimination, file a complaint with HUD immediately so we can investigate it. Fair housing is your right. Use it. To learn more, visit HUD.gov slash fair housing. That's HUD.gov slash fair housing. Or call 1-800-669-9777. 1-800-669-9777. A public service message from HUD in partnership with the National Fair Housing Alliance. Why do hedge funds and other alternative managers rely on Pershing for a highly personalized experience? Mark Alderati, a managing director at BNY Mellon's Pershing and head of Prime Services, explains. In today's fast-paced environment, where the only constants are change and volatility, you need a prime broker who's both steady and agile, focused on supporting your needs so that you can focus on growing your business and producing results. 
Exceptional client service and advocating for our clients is at the core of what we do. Our award-winning high-touch team is just one of the benefits of working with BNY Mellon. We help alternative investment managers create great experiences for their clients. Whether it's customized financing, securities lending solutions, platform access, or outsourced trading, BNY Mellon's Pershing is a prime broker who's committed to this business and dedicated to meeting your evolving demands. To learn more about the unique and industry-leading solutions for hedge funds and other alternative managers, visit Pershing.com. Pershing LLC. Member FINRA, NYSE, SIPC. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you! I beg you to come down here! Right now! Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong with Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. Did you know your favorite radio stations are in your pocket? Yes, the TuneIn app lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio anywhere you want. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow, and U.S. stock index futures are slipping, and we check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg, with S&P futures down 14 points, Dow futures down 93, NASDAQ futures down 20. The DAX in Germany is little changed, up less than a tenth of a percent. Ten-year Treasury up 9.30 seconds, yield 0.69 percent, the yield on the two-year 0.23 percent. NYMEX crude oil is up 4.6 percent, or 93 cents at 21.02 a barrel, COMEX gold is down one and a quarter percent or twenty dollars sixty cents at sixteen twenty two fifty an ounce. The euro one point oh nine six six against the dollar. British pound one point two three nine zero and the yen is at one oh eight point three eight. Home prices in twenty U.S. cities accelerating in January from a year earlier, marking the fifth straight annual gain and cooperating other recent data that showed a flurry of housing market activity prior to the coronavirus pandemic. And the Federal Reserve saying it had opened a temporary repurchase agreement facility for foreign central banks to support the smooth functioning of financial markets. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Karen, thanks so much. A quick introduction to our esteemed guest. He has his the view of America more than anyone I know. Mohammed Yunus with us of the acclaimed Gallup polling organization. Mohammed, you don't look at the horse races. You look at the fabric of the country. It's a country flat on its back. What portion of America can't get to the next rent payment? According to our estimates, uh, and based on the polling we were doing last week, 29% of empl- of those employed say that they, employers cut jobs, reduced hours, frozen hiring. 52% say that the fi- their financial situation has already been affected by this. A third of the 175 <coughs> billion workers in the U.S. cannot get to the next paycheck. They're living literally paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. That's 60 to 40 million Americans, um, and that's just the workers. So you can imagine their families. Uh, right. At this point, I think even with reporting just this morning out of Italy on some of the social unrest that now is becoming a concern, um, I think after we all think through the public health issues, what we're trying to do at Gallup is also track how Americans are feeling um, and the impact this will right. have on uh, social just disintegration, unfortunately, in some situations. I'm coming to you, Mohammed, from uh, Central Park in New York. It is an island of prosperity. I'm looking down at Billionaire's Row with seven skyscrapers. This is not America. What is the distance of Governor Cuomo's New York State or Washington or even the burgeoning crisis in Atlanta or Miami and Boston? What's the distance of those urban areas in this pandemic from the rest of a more rural, more suburban America? Um, We always see very dramatic differences. Um, One thing to point out, you mentioned Governor Cuomo, um, and a lot has been made about uh, uh, leadership and how leadership is doing in this crisis. We consistently find that Americans are much more positive on their local government at any level compared to the federal government. Um, Americans are now most in approval of uh, health care workers and their local hospitals in this crisis. Um, How Americans react to the situation, of course, depends on what's happening locally. It's interesting that 
the federal government apparently today is going to roll out um, guidelines on how local governments can also react based on their local reality. Uh, this is a huge country. Um, when we talk about the United States, you're ultimately talking about, you know, 50 different countries uh, with different realities. The economic hurt that's happening across the country, and now, we, you know, even with the social distancing, um, you know, seven to eight out of 10 Americans on pretty much every metric now are basically social distancing. When we started tracking this, there was only about 20% of people that said they were really changing their lives. Um, at this point, everything is kind of uh, So the reality of not being able to make that paycheck vis-a-vis the public health concerns, even just locally, I think are going to become the crux of the issue. This month and, has re- um, and it's what we're going to track very closely. Is. The other thing is just the well-being. I mean, uh, people, we've seen now reports of domestic violence, uh, the increasing in some localities, how people are managing the stress uh, of not only the economic challenges, but also uh, trying to jump up work if you can virtually, uh, having children at home, not having educational institutions operating. All of these things we know from our research uh, from other crises over long yeah. time in the, yeah. in the past few decades have a real impact on how society yeah. Paul, let me report here on online learning at the King household. <laughs> We're in a free period, and Minecraft is being played. And Minecraft is being played. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Mohammed, give us a sense of you know how much longer does the do most Americans feel like this will go on? This coronavirus disruption. At this point, 51 percent of Americans think that this will go on for a few months. Uh, actually, excuse me, 56 percent. The numbers are coming in daily. We started off. Uh, with uh, about half of Americans expecting it to go on for a few months. These numbers actually predate President Trump's um, change of course, if you will, in extending uh, the isolation guidelines. So we probably would expect that number to go up. Um, That being said, Americans are also overwhelmingly in support of the rescue package compared to other uh, uh, stimulus packages like TARP and, and in other situations of crisis. Today, 77% of Americans approve of it. It's bipartisan approval. Actually, Democrats, 82%, 81%, are mostly, are more likely to support it than, than Republicans. Um, but this, again, it gets back to um, what the larger picture means, I think, for people's pocketbook. 61% of Americans right now think it's very likely that the United States, that this will send the United States into a recession, if you will. So mm-hmm. people are really planning for the worst or expecting the worst. Right. Uh, whether they have the wherewithal to really get through it, I think is really up for grabs. Um, well. And in terms of the, the local learning or uh, telelearning, I actually just came up and my four-year-old is on a Zoom meeting with his other students uh, and teachers. And even just for education, it, it's amazing how a lot of this was possible before technologically, uh, but again, we see a situation where the crisis pushes us over the edge. Right, right, right. right. Our right yeah. This has been hugely valuable. Muhammad Yunus, thank you so much for your good work at Gallup uh, today. Paul, I just think some of those numbers are extraordinary, and yeah. I really give them huge credit for, like Pew and others, really looking at the fabric of our moods and emotions versus, you know, what's going to happen in the primary or the presidential yeah. stuff and all that. Yeah, and some of the numbers here are just how it, it just the vast, vast majority now recognize this crisis for what it is. And I think that's obviously up significantly from just a couple of weeks ago. Well, we've got lots to do here. We're figuring Paul's gasping too. I mean, you know, it's, yep. it's, it's you know, <laughs> as, as, we, as we isolate, as we isolate, we're falling apart. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen getting you uh, to the morning and critically to uh, the uh, market opening as well. I'm going to bring up on my Bloomberg terminal on my phone, which is hugely valuable. Futures, they've improved a little bit off the bottom. Futures negative 9. Dow futures at negative 42. Uh, and the VIX 56.76. Yields, if I use the surveillance thumb, are uh, yields a little bit lower this morning. This is Bloomberg.
apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at bevel.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. Vatsal Shah is Senior Project Engineer at Mott McDonald, a global engineering consultancy with more than 16,000 employees. He earned his PhD at New Jersey Institute of Technology and as an adjunct professor is helping NJIT students explore or emerging technologies. My focus is renewable markets, emerging technologies, the idea of floating cities. What are we doing to develop that? What will happen to the city in the water? Well, you're going to have waves hitting it. You're going to have solar. How are you going to you know, develop plants? How are you going to develop vegetation and farming? That sort of thought process happens at NGIT. We actually plan out what will the city look like? How do we develop that? So in 10 years, we're actually ready to take on those challenges when we have our first development in the water. NGIT also has been doing a lot of work in self-healing materials. So taking the polymers and the, the new material that we have in our material sciences departments and putting them into things like concrete, things like steel, reinforcing our soil. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. For centuries, Welsh farmers have been perfecting the balance between maintaining the spectacular landscapes of Wales while producing delicious lamb and beef. Lucky for us, we have everything we need from the elements. Grass, rainwater, and a whole lot of pride. Sustainability is key as we continue to work in harmony with our surroundings to bring you a plate that's uniquely Welsh. It's in the taste. Learn more at eatwelshlamandwelshbeef.com. Coming soon, Ricochet, the new action film written by, directed, and starring Euro Millions winner Timothy Barker with music by Timothy Barker. Tonight's Euro Millions jackpot is a massive £26 million. That's dream come true money. Euro Millions from the National Lottery. Your numbers make amazing happen. Play online or on the app. Estimated jackpot. Rules and procedures apply. Players must be 16 or over. Where will 2020 take you? Somewhere where people care about each other, about our planet about creating a better world for everyone and becoming the best versions of yourselves. Join a community of like-minded individuals at the University of Winchester. Apply by the 31st of March for a chance to win your first year in halls. Visit our website to find out more. See the bigger picture. Be the difference. Go to winchester.ac.uk. Tune in makes it easy to be a part of the conversation. Just make sure push notifications are enabled to hear about breaking news and trending topics from around the sports world. You'll also get custom recommendations of podcasts and radio stations covering the sports and teams you care about. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, I'm Karen Moscow, along with Tom Keene and Paul Sweeney. And the S&P 500 is lower at the open, down half percent, down 11 points to 26.15. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down a third of a percent, or 77 points, at 22,253. And the Nasdaq's down four-tenths percent, or 31 points, at 77.42. Ten-year Treasury up 12.30 seconds, yield 0.68 percent. The yield on the two-year, 0.22 percent. NYMEX crude oil up 4.6 percent, up 91 cents, at 21 dollars a barrel. Comex Gold is down 1.1% or $18.40 at 1624.70 an ounce. The euro 1.0963 against the dollar. The yen at 108.22. Tom and Paul. 
Uh, thank you so much, Karen. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. This is extremely fortunate, folks, and please listen carefully, particularly if you're in global Wall Street. The Fed came out today with a multi-syllable jumble of words that have something to do with the Central Bank of the United States of America setting up agreements with foreign central banks involving lots of money. Damien Sassauer is here to translate. Damien, help me with repo this, repo that, but it's not domestic, it's international. What's really going on? Well, that's my understanding, is that foreign central banks, Tom, are going to be able to post their treasuries, which they have plenty of for dollars, right? And obviously, this is a totally necessary and absolutely wonderful first step because it addresses the short-term liquidity stress. Clearly, for me... This seems to be aimed at the biggest holder, uh, offshore holder of treasuries, which is, of course, China. And they are not one of the banks, as we all know, that was recently um, given ability to tap the swap line. So, you know, this is definitely a good thing in my mind. And, look, I mean, if there's any risk to it, obviously, it, it, it increases the risk of medium-term non-payment for government as they become reliant on the lifelines, right? And it, secondly, probably leaves the dollar somewhat susceptible to inflationary pressure <laughs> if demand is large. So, so that's my initial take of it, Tom. So, Damien, give us a sense of just the liquidity or the lack thereof in a lot of the markets you look at right now. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, it's funny. I was just having this conversation. I mean, the declines we've seen in EMFX, Paul, are devastating for global trade because global trade is based on trade finance agreements, right? They transact in the true shadow market, the export credit insurance market, which, you know, AIG, Zurich, UR Hermé, which is Allianz backed. I mean, these are the biggest players there. So, you know, <laughs> when you have FX vol at levels like we've seen, a lot of those agreements need to be repapered. And so, you know, that's where the bottlenecks sort of arise initially if that kind of okay. makes sense of it. So there's some losses here, and the Fed is helping them stay liquid while they figure out what to do with their losses. Who tells them what to do with their losses? Do we dictate that? That is exactly right, Tom. I mean, if they become reliant on these lines, that's exactly what it imp- what it implies to me, anyway. So, you know, I, again, I guess it, it boils down to you know, a friend of the dollar. <laughs> so, who who is most reliant? Who are some of the economists maybe that you're most concerned about here as they kind of turn to the U.S. for some support? Well, I mean, I still remain, you know, focused on the miners, right? I mean, those are the ones that are relying on tourism and oil, in, you know, export flows. So, you know, that's kind of where the initial pain might have been felt prior to this, if this indeed works, right? Um, you know, I, I think the majors, you know, that would have been way further off, and we'll see them extend the defend long before them, in my mind. So I don't think there's any real risk of default necessarily, but look, it's it's nice to see that, you know, the U.S. is doing everything they can to be supportive of yeah. trade. I mean, I, that's where I'm at with Okay, that's fine. But let's, let's take a given country, and I'm not going to pick on uh, Indonesia. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to set up an agreement with Indonesia, and we're going to let them take their treasuries, throw them at us, we throw them dollars. Are we worried, Damien, about getting our dollars back? Um, well, not really. I mean, look, I mean, I, I think that's a very, that's not really a risk. You know, I mean, the dollars in terms of warehousing, where they're, I mean, it's, it's the value of that relationship between the two. I mean, I'd sit down with Shakti Das, you know, at the, at, the, at the Reserve Bank of Indonesia, and we work that out, you know. But I'm, I mean, in truth, that's not really what it's about. You know, we're not talking about, uh, you know, a little So this is like a, with, no, wait, wait, wait. This is like a bad episode of The Sopranos. That's what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right, with a gun on the table. But I, I don't think that's the real risk. The risk is, again, it's the short-term payment stress. We all know that's where the bottlenecks are. It gives people, yeah. you know, the time they need for these trade agreements to really kind of be repapered. I think this is a, it's, it's a logical yeah. and necessary first step. Okay. Within all this, Paul, and I, I, let me ask you a question, Paul, and then jump in here with a bunch if you want. You know, I, I'm looking, Damien, at this, and I'm looking at $20 oil, and Javier Blas is telling me it's really trading at 18 or $17 a barrel because it's a tangible, et cetera, product. And there's a, again, a bunch of futures mumbo jumbo in there as well. Is the catalyst for this the implosion of commodities? 
Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a repricing, Tom. I mean, look, I think it's getting repapered. And I think, you know, this is, I mean, we, you know, emerging markets, we live through this. We live through commodity volatility. And it's not just in oil. It's in places like iron ore and steel. If you want to look at real vols, I mean, that's where the men trade, right? So, I right. mean, these, these, these countries are used to this type of volatility in terms of export outflows. I mean, just look at tourism. I mean, how much more cyclical can you get? So, you know, yeah. again, I think, I think they're prepared for it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just, again, I'm, 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 I, I can applaud the Fed and, and the U.S. Yeah. administration for putting this through. Paul, so, Paul, repapering, just so you can translate that for a larger audience, that's when Afterthought comes in and says she wants Minecraft wallpaper. That's <laughs> exactly, what repapering is. Exactly. That's the theme this morning. That's repapering. Damien, are, are we going to see, uh, are countries going to need to, I guess, you know, redo some trade deals given what's happened in the yeah. commodities markets, as you called out? Well, I think that began with the trade war. I mean, I think that's all taking place as we speak, you know, but beneath the surface, obviously. But, you know, at this point, no one's doing much of anything, right? People are hunkering down and, and trying to, you know, get things under control and make sure their house is in order. But, you know, people are going to dump the kitchen sink at this, Paul, and you're going to see some really big changes, not just domestically, obviously. You have plenty of people can speak to that, but internationally. And so I think this is the beginning of that. I mean, I think it's going to be far more regional. I think geographics and demographics are where you want to be focused. Hmm, interesting. So, Damien, so there's still, I'm looking at the dollar DXY index still up at 99 and change here. Still, I mean, that's still the place you just have to be, right, the dollar? Yeah, you know, until further notice, clearly. I mean, look, it's the backbone of everything we do. So I think that's, but, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely, I mean, people are showing right now, I think the markets are, are, are definitely exposing cracks in the surface. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people are going to approach dollar and plus their currency risk in a very different way going forward. Yeah, well, what's the IMF going to do? I mean, you know, every institution... I think the IMF loses could... out here. I think the IMF <clears throat> is losing importance. It's becoming more... I, okay. I have to say this, okay. to Tom. I mean, this is the U.S. taking matters into their own hand. That he's exactly. avoiding the multilateral uh, okay. response to this. Everybody knows I've got a wonderful relationship with Madame Lagarde now over in Frankfurt at the ECB. <laughs> I was honored to go to the International Monetary Fund and introduce and do an interview in front of the elite of the IMF for Kristalina Georgieva. Georgieva, I'm a big fan. D- D- Damien, how's she doing? I-, I mean, she's handed this crisis. I, I think she's, ha- she's, she's been handed a... <laughs> She's been handed a hell of an appetizer for what I hope will be a long and promising career for, for her. I think Yorgeva, you know, she she came from a third world. She came from Bulgaria. You know, she's got yeah. experience in, in, in these countries and how they, what they need. And, you know, you just you could just hope that the IMF has their ear to the ground and we could use them as, you know, a source of information. But clearly, you know, the U.S. is taking matters into their own hand here. And this, in my mind, does undermine, undermine you know, the strength of the multilateral is response she, to emerging markets. Damien, is she constrained because... Because her number one donor is President Trump? <laughs> you could say that. But, I mean, there are multiple donors. I don't know. that no, no one really knows the levels. Everyone assumes it's the U.S. clearly. I mean, it's, it, it goes without saying it is. But, um, but certainly the EU and Japan, and, and, and uh, there are quite a num- uh, big funders to the institution. So, you know, everyone's going to have a seat at the table. But this is, this is kind of, in my mind, if it's done in the way I'm envisioning it might be, this is pretty groundbreaking stuff, Tom. So, Damien, just in emerging markets, what are you looking at right now? What are you, what are you working on? Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm looking for the safe havens amid, amid the chaos. So for me, I've been looking at China. I mean, China, I mean, there are only two markets of the 24 emerging local currency government bond markets that are up on the air, Paul. One is China, the other is Egypt. But China's up 1.9% if you just kind of spread it around China government bonds. The, the, the dollar yuan has remained remarkably stable. I mean, their reserves are still well above $3 trillion. I mean, you know, it's a sluggish economy. Growth is slowing. That's good for local bond markets. And if they can keep the currency vol down, it's, it's a good place to get some coupon income. Damien Sassauer, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. Tom, there's a lot for Damien Sassauer on that emerging yeah. markets business to kind of focus yeah. on. And it's it's only two markets up, Egypt and China. Yeah, we're thrilled he could come on in short notice and uh, give us perspective there on that important Federal Reserve announcement. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Tom Paul, thank you very much. Spain had its deadliest day yet in the coronavirus crisis. The country reported almost 850 more deaths, raising the toll of those in Spain to close to 8,200. Italy is discussing an extension of lockdown measures into May. New York City, which is emerging as the new epicenter of the pandemic, 
reported a 16% increase in deaths in six hours. New Orleans is a microcosm of the dilemma facing cities and counties across the country. An expected surge in coronavirus cases combined with a dangerous shortage of medical equipment and supplies. Bloomberg's Martin DeCarroll reports. Last week, Louisiana's governor asked for 5,000 ventilators out of the federal stockpile. New Orleans Mayor LaToya Cantrell says some are finally on the way. We were told today uh, to expect 150. In no way that's enough. And the virus is threatening to disable the city's battalion of first responders, the very people who will be needed to care for patients. New Orleans EMS director Dr. Emily Nichols says more than 100 out of 170 EMTs had direct contact with people infected with the coronavirus. Anyone who has as symptoms, we are taking them out of service immediately. Five so far have tested positive. Martin DeCaro, Bloomberg Radio. Hospitals are threatening to fire health care workers who publicize their working conditions during the coronavirus pandemic and have in some cases followed through. Ming Lin, an emergency room physician in Washington State, said he was told Friday he was out of a job because he'd given an interview to a newspaper about a Facebook post detailing what he believed to be inadequate protective equipment and testing. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg, Tom. Well, Michael Barr, thanks so much. Paul Sweeney, distance learning update. We're still playing <laughs> Minecraft. I'm still playing Minecraft. Um, so it's an arduous day at school. Paul, tell us how Netflix is doing. I guess there was a streaming war, and it was everybody against Netflix. I really haven't had a Netflix update in a while. How are they yeah, doing? Yeah, they're doing fine. I mean, the usage is up. Um, and I think you know what we're seeing now is uh, obviously people staying at home. They're actually consuming more media, not surprisingly, really? uh, I guess. Really? And uh, <laughs> including games games and uh so netflix is doing fine and i think what we're seeing from the you know the disney pluses of the world and the hbo goes and all the other streaming services out there is a lot of sampling tom people trying to just uh they have yeah. a lot of time so they're sampling and uh we'll see how this really impacts um kind of media usage will it accelerate cord cutting even more which would be bad news for the traditional media companies but um, you know there's again media consumption up significantly it'd be interesting to see how it plays out after this thing passes though but is um, netflix still hit driven have they changed their strategy at all or are they they're really basically- driven by i think they're really driven they, like a lot of media companies the answer is yes uh, but they're really driven by their uh, original programming they you know they invest like 15 billion dollars in, in programming and they come up with a game of, uh, you know with all these uh, uh, big, uh, you know, stories and big uh, series, and uh, that's still what drives uh, that's still subscriber what, it's growth. It's the same so. formula as before. It is, it is, and uh, they're spending more and more money and more and more on original programming uh, because you know the traditional media companies are pulling back on their content. Disney's yeah. pulling all their content back for their stuff. So yeah, well, let me do a data check here, folks. Equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, VIX in two solid, VIX in two solid points, fifty four point nine six on the VIX, the Dow negative eighty two. 22244 22244 Standard Poor's down 11 points this morning Yields, as I look at the Bloomberg terminal on my phone Yields are down This is Bloomberg This is a Bloomberg Pursuits look at luxury If you're newly working from home You may already be asking yourself Do I dress up for a digital check-in? What if I'm the boss? Is wearing a sport coat while working from the couch borderline insanity? Strange questions, sure, but we live in strange times. Some savvy brands are leveraging these uncharted waters to push a new type of hybridized clothing that straddles the line between formal and casual. In other words, a blazer that's actually sweatpants. One such brand, Nice Stuff, offers $345 blazers and casual knits, while a British clothier is making a drawstring suit. French luxury goods maker LVMH says its revenue dropped as much as 20% in the latest quarter. Luxury goods struggled to find their footing even during the coronavirus outbreak's earliest days at the beginning of the year when it spread across China, although shopping is starting to pick up once more in certain markets. Visit BloombergPursuits.com for more. I'm Andrew O'Day, Bloomberg Radio. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. I came out in the 11th grade. Nobody was embracing you. The kids were cruel. It was very difficult to be gay. 
Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. The hard part was determining that I was going to do it, but I definitely didn't do it alone. At age 30, with the help of her mentor, Carissa finished her high school diploma. I have a mentor, Maria. She convinced me to continue my education and finish what I started to get my diploma. She just never judges. She's a true role model. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Did you know that Players of People's Postcode Lottery have raised over £500 million for charities and good causes? They've also won £47 million in prizes so far this year. And it could be your postcode next. Visit postcodelottery.co.uk forward slash radio before midnight on the 23rd of April to play in the May draws. PPL manage lotteries on behalf of good causes. 16 plus, conditions apply, play responsibly. Right now, Talk Talk TV and Vasta Fibre is just £25.50 a month, fixed for 18 months. Plus, you get a year of Amazon Prime on us, over 80 Freeview channels, all the on-demand players and average speeds of 38 megabits per second. Plus, unlimited one-day delivery, thousands of movies, TV shows and more from Amazon. Massive entertainment package, tiny price. See if you want to spend on popcorn. Search Talk Talk TV. Talk Talk for everyone. Offer ends 22nd of April, subject to availability. T's and C's apply. Not all heroes wear capes, but most wear tights. And here we go, oh, guys, no. underway! Cover by Rowan! Wait a second! Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with the TuneIn Podcast. For expert analysis of the latest WrestleMania, turn on the WWE Podcast. Or listen to the Steve Austin Show for no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities. It's good to be here tonight. It's an empty building. But I'm for these and more, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. And breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And U.S. stocks are falling, leaving the S&P 500 on track for its worst quarter since the depths of the financial crisis. As investors debate whether the market meltdown has ended, given the continued spread of the coronavirus, the S&P 500 is down more than 19.5% year-to-date, down another 1% this morning, down 26 points at 25.99. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down 1% or 224 points at 22,109. The Nasdaq's down half percent or 41 points at 77.32. 10-year Treasury up 11.30 seconds, yield 0.69%. The yield on the two-year, 0.22%. Nymex crude oil up 2.5%, up 51 cents at $20.60 a barrel. Comex gold down 1.1%, or $17.70 at $16.25.50 an ounce. The euro, 1.0970 against the dollar. The yen, 108.17. And the Federal Reserve saying it had opened a temporary repurchase agreement facility for foreign central banks to support the smooth functioning of financial markets. That's a Bloomberg business flash tom and paul karen moscow thank you so much we appreciate that uh looking uh, at the markets here we're seeing a little bit of a risk off day today not surprising a lot of volatility off about one percent in the equity markets let's bring in our good friend barry ritholtz tom we haven't heard from barry in a couple of days yeah. barry what are you thinking about here as we continue our lockdown and the markets continue to fluctuate what's on the top of your list so I think it's the same thing that's on the top of everybody's list, which is when will we wrestle the coronavirus into submission? The answer to that question will determine whether this is a temporary blip or a longer issue, whether the economy is going to snap back quickly, or whether it's going to be a longer, more painful recovery. Goldman Sachs is out there with some very dire GDP numbers, a 34% decline in the quarter. That's up from, I think, the last forecast of a week and a half or so ago of 24%. So uh, look at an unemployment at 15%. Uh, so the numbers are clearly, Barry, you know, over the next you know, coming months, if not quarters, are going to be very dire. How does the market navigate that? So, so good news, bad news. Uh, the bad news is those numbers are probably optimistic. We're probably going to end up with closer to 30% unemployment. I, you can see GDP cut in half. The good news is you can throw those forecasts out if this is a temporary one-month, two-month, three-month externality. 
then we should have a fairly normal recovery for the <laughs> economy and a decent fallback for, for the stock market. But never has an equity market been so dependent on data, and that data is when can we treat this, how fast can we flatten the curve, and how soon do, are we on the other side of the infection yeah. um, expansion. Mary, a young guy like you hasn't seen all the crises I've seen, but review for us the actual experience of waiting for the bottom, whether it's 87, 98, all the different color and character. My first big thing was continental Illinois blowing up a million years ago. But but in, a, in these emotions, what's your experience of that normal human condition? I'm going to wait for the bottom. So it's really quite fascinating uh, for a couple of reasons. First, what we think of as news is really quite old, and, and one of the thing, things that the market does better than anybody else is take all of these various data points and news sources and digest them and reflect them in price very, very quickly. A perfect example, I can't tell you how many people called me last week and said, I don't understand, this was the worst uh, new unemployment claims data ever. Why is the market rallying on yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the answer was all the states had released the data in the previous seven days. That Thursday release, which we'll get in two more days once again, is an amalgam of, of data that was out there. The people who assemble that data and figure it out get to make the bet before the actual news release. News, news releases like that are backwards looking and old. And when we look at all sorts of crises, whether it was 87 or 80, 82, uh, 98 long-term capital management, the Asian contagion in 99, markets bottom long before the news starts to improve. If you wait for the, the question I keep getting is, when will the dust settle and I could buy? If you wait for the all-clear signal, you will have missed the bottom and probably... <clears throat> By a substantial yeah. amount. Look, look back to March 09. That was the low. The news flow was still terrible for another three, four, five months after that. So, I mean, Barry, are I mean, you the I, I, Paul, Paul, I don't mean to yeah. interrupt, but just so you know, my <laughs> old investment company was the all clear signal <laughs> investment company. Exactly. So, Barry, I mean, are you, are you of the opinion that this market is. If it's not bottomed, you know, a week or so ago, it's setting a bottom here, or given all the news that's to come, there's still some more pain here. So there is no doubt that March 23rd was a bottom. We had a huge move off of those lows, uh, mostly in anticipation of that $2 trillion uh, stimulus package. Another perfect example, the market rallied long before the president signed that, that package. The question is... Are we closer to the end of this than the beginning of this? If Forget Easter, because that's already gone. But let's say May 15th, May 30th, lockdowns start to ease, people start to normalize, things return to the way it was. This will end up looking like a temporary blip, sort of like the 1987 crash and subsequent recovery, and then things start to move back to normal. If, on the other hand... The warm weather doesn't make this any better. We don't find a treatment for six months. We don't find a vaccine for two years. This could be a long and sustained, um, a long and sustained recession. I mean, we're clearly in a recession already, and it could turn into something much deeper that derails the secular bull market that really began uh, after the financial crisis ended. I hate when people say, well, it, it depends. It's so data dependent. Really, this is a binary outcome. Either we're on top of this within the next 30 to 60 days, or we're not. And the longer it goes, the worse it is. Barry Ritholtz, thank you so much for joining Barry, us. Barry, thank you so much. Yep. Greatly yep. appreciate it. Barry Ritholtz, Ritholtz Capital Management. He's a Bloomberg <clears throat> Opinion columnist. And I don't know what else he does. He does a ton. He, he, he picks some movies, things, you know, too. He he's hugging movies his too. dogs. He's home hugging his dogs. Yep. You know, Paul, but that's that's just so true. The all-clear signal. There's never down, been one. I'm nope. going to make it an all-clear signal. Ever.
No, no, and uh, you know, I think it's just a. I think Barry's just spot on here. It's a, just all about timing, uh, and, and we don't re- don't really have a great sense at all, if at all, uh, yeah, the but, timing of this thing. And so that, yeah, that's the uncertainty that's in the market. And, and don't you agree, Paul, that the timing part is the getting back into the market? To me, it's wildly asymmetric. Yes, and it's 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 so much harder to get in once you get out. Yeah, it is, and uh, you know, it's it's tough to find valuation levels that might might be a trigger, uh, given that there's so much uncertainty yeah. about the underlying uh, virus and the spread thereof globally, and what it means for uh, the global economies and the global markets. The Dow down 253 points, 22081. We are produced somewhere in isolation. Richard Truman. Asset manager. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you! I beg you to come down here right now! Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong with Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. On this week's On the Media, we are awash in messages, but some messengers are more effective than others. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. Meanwhile, some media outlets choose not to air the president's press briefings live, and media critics ponder what's the right balance between good information and all information. All that and more on this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? It's TuneIn Sports on this day. March 31st, 2004, New York Yankees starter Kevin Brown becomes only the second pitcher in MLB history to have beaten all 30 teams. Got him over the outside corner. An 11 strikeout night for Kevin Brown. They win it on the arm and of Kevin Brown here tonight. Overwhelming performance by Brown. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. To keep ahead of the curve. At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Stocks opened lower on Wall Street today as investors continue to debate whether the market meltdown has ended given the continued spread of the coronavirus. The benchmark for stocks is down more than 18% this year in the U.S. as measures to combat the pandemic shutter large parts of the economy. Goldman Sachs is now forecasting a 34% contraction in the second quarter before a sharp rebound in the third. Carnival expects a net loss for fiscal 2020 as the coronavirus decimates the cruise business. The company is suspending dividends and buybacks. Meanwhile, Royal Caribbean is extending its modified cancellation policy through September 1st. The policy allows cancellations up to 48 hours prior to sailing for any reason. Passengers get a full credit usable on any future cruise this year or next. And Visa is once again lowering its outlook for revenue growth in the fiscal second quarter, saying the coronavirus pandemic has led to a sharp decline in cardholders' overseas spending. Gina Cervetti, Bloomberg Radio. 
You're living in a world built on science, political and economic. You've got to believe the labor market gets hit. Computer and medical. Clarify where we are on a test. It all makes a difference. What do you think needs to happen in terms of governmental response? And it's all here. He expects the virus to peak quite a long time from now. Get your science straight. The hand-washing campaign. Is this actually a good strategy? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Markets with Lisa Abramowitz and Paul Sweeney. Are we on the brink of a more serious downturn? I've always thought of the municipal bond market as a little bit of a safe haven. Banks are going to have to start paying their depositors more. Are we still in that mode where we're buying the dips? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. Cash, if you're looking at treasury bills, provides a higher return to stocks and bonds here in the U.S. If your consumer is a woman, you're more likely to be a growth company. Longer-term interest rates can go down even with short-term interest rates still going up a little bit. This is Bloomberg Markets with Lisa Abramowitz and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Good Tuesday morning from New York City and parts beyond to our worldwide audience. Coming up, we will drive the conversation forward. Markets trading off a little bit this morning. We're going to take a look at oil. Oil continues to be very volatile. It's trading down here at $20 a barrel. President Trump speaking with Putin. Will that impact the market? But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg, what do you have? Paul, well, this just crossing the uh, Bloomberg Terminal Consumer Confidence falls to 120 even from 132.6. This Bloomberg Business Flash is sponsored by Build America Mutual. Is your municipal bond investment safe even if the next recession reduces public revenues? Yes. Double A guaranteed. BAM Municipal Bond Insurance protects against everything that causes a default. Visit buildamerica.com. Stocks are down, leaving the S&P on track for its worst quarter since the depths of the financial crisis as investors debate whether the market meltdown has ended given the continued spread of the coronavirus. Treasuries and the dollar are up. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg Radio. S&P 500 is down eight-tenths of a percent, down 21. The Dow's down eight-tenths of a percent, down 172. And the Nasdaq's down four-tenths of a percent, down 29. The 10-year is up 13, 30 seconds. The yield is 0.68 percent. West Texas Intermediate Crude is up 2.1 percent at 2051 a barrel. Comex Gold is down 1.2 percent at 1624.30 an ounce. The dollar yen, 108.24. The euro is $1.947. And the British pound, $1.2392. At your Bloomberg Business Flash, I'm Greg Jarrett. Now, Bloomberg Markets is on with Lisa Abramowitz and Paul Sweeney. Thank you so much, Greg Jarrett. This has been the longest month ever, the longest quarter <laughs> ever. It is official. Uh, the superlatives are dramatic. And there was, remember that stretch of about two weeks where it was either limit up or limit down yep. at some point? And it just seemed uh, like the new normal, given the fact that we're not seeing, you know, Massive swings today is a victory, even if it's losses. And Dave Wilson, Bloomberg Stocks Editor, come on in here. Uh, just to sort of take a look back at the quarter that almost was. I mean, it's not over, and I don't want to jinx anything by saying that we're entering a period of perhaps a little more calm. But that's what it feels like, right? Just for the moment, at least. I mean, bear <laughs> in mind you're looking at the biggest quarterly decline in the S&P 500 since the fourth quarter of 2008, which is really when the financial crisis kind of played out in the markets. I mean, uh, S&P 500 down almost 19.5% at the moment. And as far as March goes, you're looking at the worst month since October 2008 uh, with an almost 12% decline. So that kind of puts things in context today. I mean, you could say there's some relief just because of the magnitude of the losses. You're not seeing all that much. Uh, the S&P 500 down about 1%. It's still a, a fairly broad-based decline. I mean, uh, 10 of the 11 main industry groups in the S&P 500 are lower. Energy is the exception. We've seen crude oil bounce off $20 a barrel. So a bit of relief for the stocks. Uh, another thing that's interesting is you look at the cruise lines, you see Royal Caribbean and Norwegian have the two biggest gains in the S&P 500, both up roughly 12.5%, 13%. 
and yet Carnival is lower at this point. It's making well, back its losses. In fact, actually, it's now a little change. But Dave, this is a stock that really took a hit early on because the company's raising $6 billion, selling notes, selling convertible well, bonds, selling Can I give shares. you some color? Let me give you some color on that. Just quickly, I've got to jump in because, yes, Carnival is marketing debt, right? They're trying to raise money for three years. Let me just give you the coupon that they're offering to entice investors. The coupon on three-year bonds from Carnival right now is said to be about 12 and a half wow. percent, Dave. And, and Paul, I mean, just to give you some perspective about the distress that's being perceived by credit investors. All right, carry on, carry on. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that kind of shows you where things are at this point. Carnival's now turned higher. What does that tell you? I mean, uh, you know, because most of what they're raising is either going to be equity initially, a one and a quarter billion dollars worth of shares, what they're looking at. Or, you know, convertible securities, they're going to turn the shares down the line if all goes well for Carnival in terms of a recovery once we get past the worst of the coronavirus. So, you know, that that's sort of where the focus is right now. And uh, now the stock's up. It just goes to show you how much strength there is in the group at this point, uh, enough to pull Carnival higher even as they raise a whole lot more money. Well, the COVID-19 uh, volume. Utilities, even impacting the M&A market, I see the Borg Warner may back away from its $1.5 billion deal to buy Delphi Technologies. I guess after Delphi took down its revolver or borrowed some money? Exactly. I mean, uh, the maximum $500 million that they could borrow. But the key is they didn't go to Borg Warner first and ask for permission. So, you know, that's the issue at this point. Uh, Borg Warner is giving Delphi 30 days to kind of rectify things. I don't know how you do that in this environment. And Delphi shares down about 27% at this point. So clearly the issue coming up with the deal is not going over well. All right, Dave, I want to dig into one sector that's been uniquely punished. That's the banking sector. Financials have absolutely gotten crushed. I'm looking right now at the S&P sub-index for financials down more than 30% year-to-date, and, and certain large caps are down more than that. Mid-sized regional banks absolutely hammered. And I'm trying to figure out what this is all about, what the takeaway here is. People talk about the fact that we're not seeing the same types of financial stress leading into this or those sort of precarious situation. They're very well capitalized. Everyone says that. They have enough liquidity. They're being backstopped by the Fed. This isn't, doesn't seem to be an expression of credit losses. Is that right? Is this still a low yield, low business kind of uh, statement or, or is it something more? Well, if you kind of put the situation all together, I mean, the banks are not in a good position. You can argue, sure, they're, they're in better shape in terms of their capital than they were going back to 2008. But at the same time, I mean, you've got interest rates kind of going against them. You've got an economy going against them. So, you know, it raises the question of uh, how do they kind of manage their business through all this? And we've seen the story before. I mean, people clearly are concerned. I mean, given the magnitude of the declines, you look at the, you know, the, the banks in the S&P 500 and you see losses in some cases of more than 50%. Comerica, the worst performer in the S&P 500 financials index, down almost 57%. So, you know, losses like that tell you that, that people are concerned about where we're headed you know, with the memories of, of 2008 and everything that went along with it still kind of fresh in their minds, arguably. But aren't, uh, you know, I think one of the themes I think we've heard is that the banking system writ large is better, is in a better place now than it was before the financial crisis. Yeah, we, we have heard that. And now it's a matter of these banks being able to show it in terms of how they manage their way through what looks like, at the very least, uh, two quarters worth of declines and a relatively severe one for the economy in the second quarter. You know, how severe, who knows? I mean, the numbers just keep popping up. I mean, Goldman Sachs uh, has just you know, brought down their forecast in terms <laughs> yes, of where the second quarter is headed. So. You know, it's going to be a tough time for a whole lot of financial companies. It's really a situation. How did they get through it? What yeah. did they look like on the other side? And there's a question about solvency. That doesn't seem to be an issue. These banks seem to be just fine on that front. But then there's another issue of profitability. And there are questions, especially at a time when people are, are probably going to be missing payments on consumer debt, on, on mortgage uh, payments that are due, et cetera. That's sort of a key question. And Dave Wilson, Bloomberg Stocks Editor, thank you so much, as always, uh, for that. We look forward to your next report. I have to just take a moment here, Paul, yes. and mention the bond market. Um, 
the bond market, just an unbelievable quarter. If you take a look at Treasury yields and how much they got whipsawed, they started at 1.2%. I'm looking at 10-year yields right now uh, that basically have come down in half, half. so yes. far this year. Just shocking to look at. They were 1.9% at the end of last year, currently 0.68%. Yeah, just extraordinary moves uh, in the market. And two-year at 0.22%. So, uh, yeah, again, the, the credit markets, treasury markets, just extraordinary as well. Yeah, people definitely pricing in very low inflation for the foreseeable future, which we're going to talk more about with Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence coming up because there's a big question. Inflation, deflation, he has a strong view. We'll get it. Right now, let's head to our 1901 studios in Washington, D.C. Nathan Hager with World and National Headlines. Nathan. Well, Lisa, the number of coronavirus cases around the world continues to spike. The U.S. recorded more than 500 coronavirus deaths in one day yesterday, the first time that's happened. In an epidemic that's now infected more than 160,000 Americans and killed more than 3,100, more states are imposing stay-at-home orders. And Ohio Governor Mike DeWine says now is not the time to let up on that. We're into a crucial period of time. And my message to my fellow Ohioans is we can't let up now. We've got to really, really stay at this uh, or or we're going to see this don't come at us even stronger. The President Trump says he has considered a nationwide stay-at-home order, but it's looking pretty unlikely that he'll impose that, he says. Discussions have begun on a fourth round of stimulus. Sources tell Bloomberg the White House has compiled roughly $600 billion in requests from agencies. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi told MSNBC the package needs to include more state and local aid. She's also hinting that she could move toward mail-in balloting this November. The coronavirus continues to spread in Europe, as we hear from Bloomberg's Leon and Garen's in London. Here in the UK, the number of coronavirus cases have reached 22,000, though there is concern over the amount of testing taking place. Italy remains the epicentre in Europe, with cases eclipsing 100,000. Spain and France are both reporting the most deaths in a single day. The World Health Organization expects infections in Europe to stabilise soon, saying outbreaks in Italy and Spain could be nearing their peak. The WHO also says that lockdowns in Europe are now starting to pay off. In London, I'm Leanne Gerrans, Bloomberg Radio. Global news on air and on quick take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. Two people who are as fascinated by the markets as you are. What's your sense of the competitive landscape in the cloud business? Lisa Abramowitz. People are talking about potential regulatory pressure. And Paul Sweeney. Are you seeing flows into ESG ETFs? Bloomberg Markets. What's your main conversation today with some of these corporate executives? Weekday mornings at 10 Eastern. They're spending a lot of money there. On Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business App, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg. The world is listening. To protect his home and family from disaster, Steve used courage, wisdom, and his camera phone. That should do it. Way to go, Steve! By simply taking digital pictures of his family's important documents, Steve can always have them stored safely online, no matter when disaster strikes. Learn other simple ways to protect your home and family before a natural disaster at ready.gov. That's ready.gov. A message from FEMA and the Ad Council. In-depth analysis, concise reporting, need-to-know global business news. Around the world and across the markets, Bloomberg connects the dots for decision makers. Stay on top of today's headlines. Follow big breakthroughs in tech. Understand the latest political issues. See how the world's wealthiest are spending their money. Track what's happening in the markets and much more. Subscribe today to Bloomberg, the global standard for business reporting. Get it all at Bloomberg.com slash subscriptions. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. At age 30, Carissa finished her high school diploma. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, you can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. March 31st, 2004, New York Yankees starter Kevin Brown becomes only the second pitcher in MLB history to have beaten all 30 teams. 
Got him over the outside corner. An 11 strikeout night for Kevin Brown. They win it on the arm end of Kevin Brown here tonight. Overwhelming performance by Brown. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? Not all heroes wear capes, but most wear tights. And here we go, guys! Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with the TuneIn Podcast. For expert analysis of the latest WrestleMania, turn on the WWE Podcast. Or listen to the Steve Austin Show for no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities. It's good to be here tonight. It's an empty building. But I'm for these more, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. On this week's On the Media, we are awash in messages, but some messengers are more effective than others. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. Meanwhile, some media outlets choose not to air the president's press briefings live, and media critics ponder what's the right balance between good information and all information. All that and more on this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Leave it to the New York Times to make the most intelligent pop music podcast out there. Welcome to the New York Times Popcast. On the Popcast, the Times music staff gets together for a weekly roundtable on the hottest topics in popular music. From award show autopsies and reactions to new releases to difficult to process scandals and emerging themes in the music landscape, hear distinguished music critics share their perspectives on the latest music news, songs, albums, and artists of note on the New York Times Popcast. Search and favorite Popcast to join the conversation. Conversation. Success. Visit Pershing.com to learn more about Pershing's integrated wealth experience. Pershing LLC and Pershing Advisor Solutions LLC are both members of FINRA and SIPC. Are you interested in a challenging and exciting career? One where you can be part of solving complex challenges across industries and geographies. Bloomberg's ever-expanding technology, data, news, and media services foster innovation, empower clients, and offer nearly limitless opportunities for career growth. Visit Bloomberg.com slash careers today to view our current job opportunities. Bloomberg LP is an equal opportunity employer. The address once again is Bloomberg.com slash careers. Message and data rates may apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at bevel.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. U.S. stocks come off earlier losses and actually move into positive territory. The benchmark for American equities is down, however, more than 18% for the year as measures to fight the pandemic shutter large parts of the economy. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day here on Bloomberg Radio. The S&P 500 is now up two-tenths of a percent, up six. The Dow's up four-tenths of a percent, up 86. And the Nasdaq is up eight-tenths of a percent, up 63. The 10-year is up 16 30 seconds. The yield point six seven percent West Tech Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is up 3.1% at uh, currently 2072 a barrel. Comex Gold is down over 1%. That's 1626.60 an ounce. Dollar yen, 108.17. The euro is $1.966. And the British pound, $1.2434. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. This is Bloomberg Markets with Lisa Abramowitz and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. 
If you listen really closely, you can hear the helicopters hovering above you, ready to drop some cash. That is sort of the feeling out there as the U.S. government passes one stimulus uh, effort or bailout effort, if you want to call it that, uh, that will deliver checks to Americans. Already in the works is yet another one. And the question that I have been having persistently is, is this inflationary or deflationary? Ira Jersey has a very strong view on this, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. And I want to continue the conversation because a lot of people people are struggling here, thinking that normally when you print money, that is inflationary. Why is the bond market saying the exact opposite? Yeah, I think for two reasons. I think one is that the, you know, quote unquote helicopter money that you just mentioned is really just replacing income and revenues that are going to be lost by a lot of businesses uh, globally. Because the way that money gets into the economy is the Federal Reserve creates base money, right, or any central bank creates what's called base money. And then banks go out and then lend money to other people, to their to their customers. And that's how money flows into the system. In an environment like this, you're not creating um, uh, a lot of new money and a lot of loans that are going to be used to expand businesses. These are just going to be used to keep businesses afloat. So it, it's not necessarily uh, in, inflationary where you're going to see hyperinflation, but it, it's designed in many ways to reduce the worst case deflation scenarios. And, and the market's kind of pricing for that because we're not pricing for um, for uh, consumer prices to go down a lot uh, for a long period of time. So it's basically we're expecting um, it, prices to go down very quickly now, but then rebound to you know some level of like one and a half percent a couple of uh, years from now. So, Ira, talk to us a little bit about the liquidity that we're seeing in the marketplace. That was really a concern a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, give us a sense of kind of where that is right now. Are the markets functioning, um, I guess, you know, uh, you know, well at this stage? Well, I would say they, they're functioning better um, okay. than they were certainly last week and the week before, but they're still not to where they were, say, a month ago um, in, in late February when you were able basically to buy or sell a significant amount of risk. One of the reasons for that um, is at this point is actually the opposite problem than we had two weeks ago, which is, um, you know, two weeks ago, basically, uh, bank balance sheets, what banks were and dealers were unwilling to take a lot of risk onto their books one way or the other, whether they were short rates or long rates. Now, with the Federal Reserve purchasing, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of Treasury securities from the dealers every week, um, dealers are not left with a lot of securities on their balance sheet. So uh, you've actually seen a couple of uh, auctions that were undersubscribed. So basically, dealers didn't even bit, uh, offer enough bonds into these auctions for the Fed to buy all of them. So um, you're in an environment now where um, there's actually, uh, it's much easier to sell bonds for sure because the Fed's buying uh, almost every bond that they can find. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it, it's not normal market function. Yeah, but it's not normal market function when you see the Fed's balance sheet spike upwards. It's now about five and a quarter trillion dollars. Uh, that deleveraging period, the shrinking of the balance sheet happened for about two minutes there. I'm just wondering, uh, Ira, we talked about this last time. Given the renewed uh, assumptions and the expectations around the fiscal rescue uh, efforts and beyond, how big is the central bank's balance sheet going to get eventually in this year or in the near future? Yeah, so, so the Fed's balance sheet, you know, our, our expectation is for it to basically double this year from where it was a couple of weeks ago and then, um, you know, well more than double um, uh, over the next couple of years. And a big reason for that, though, um, and we have to revise that, too, now because the Fed actually just came out with a new program this morning where it's going to allow um, foreign central banks to repo their treasury bonds. So that's going to expand the balance sheet even further. Um so it, it's going to get big, right? It's going to be a $10 trillion number, easy, um, if not more. Um, the technical, that's it, technical, Paul. It's going to be is. big. Carry <laughs> on, carry big. on. <laughs> so, so one of the, you know, but, but the size of the Fed's balance sheet, even though it's going to be really large, it's going to be very variable. And, and a lot of the programs that they're designing now are naturally going to go away. So it's likely, you know, that we'll, we might spike the Fed's balance sheet over the next year or so to, you know, 10, 11, 12 trillion dollars. But then it might naturally come back down to, to seven or eight billion dollars just because um, they're going to own all these treasuries and probably hold them for a long period of time, probably forever, quite frankly. But some of these other programs like the repo programs and, and the like, those will naturally shrink as the economy improves, hopefully, you know, come 2021, 2022.
do. So, Ira, what's next for the Federal Reserve? Do they have any tools left in their toolbox? Well, they have a lot of little tools, certainly for funding. I, I think, you know, basically implementing the programs that have already been announced, I think, is has to be the next thing. Remember, we haven't, most of the programs that were announced last week have not yet been implemented. So things like the commercial paper funding program, that's not going to be uh, probably started till next week or the week after. You have the corporate bond buying program. And importantly, and I think this is the, the single biggest one for the overall health of the economy, is that Main Street funding facility. So the small and medium-sized enterprise facility run between the Treasury, the Small Business Administration, and funded by the Fed, that program has to get going and has to get going quickly if we're going to see a, uh, a V-shaped kind of recovery over the next year. If not, then it's going to be much more of a U, uh, in my opinion. Ira Jersey, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your thoughts here. Ira Jersey, Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us on the phone, uh, Lisa. So, again, I think there's still, uh, as Ira was suggesting, more for the Fed to do here. But per, you know, I guess initially it's just to implement some of those programs that are you know were announced last week. Yeah, uh, in, in on Bloomberg surveillance, Ira said that basically the Fed may end up owning the market. You know, <laughs> the, the bulk. I mean, at a certain point, if they're backstopping corporate bonds, they're backstop, uh, they're backstopping commercial paper, they're backstopping treasuries. You know, they're putting they're back put in your entire portfolio. Yeah, other central banks from around the world letting the convert uh, to get the dollars and, and so on. So uh, interesting, the Fed stepping up here. And, and we have to admit, I mean, the Fed was really aggressive and really, I think, out in front of this as much and as right it on. possibly could be. Yeah, Absolutely. And, 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 and right on. And then uh, it's been fiscal stimulus since then, but the Fed has been uh, right there. A little bit of green. We turned uh, green here a little bit. Uh, we have the S&P up eight, the Dow up uh, 83 points. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Money Minute. Stocks are lower this final trading day of the quarter, the worst since 2008. Investors at a crossroads questioning whether extraordinary economic stimulus by dozens of countries can counter the continued retrenchment of companies and consumers as the outbreak spreads. Oil heading for its worst quarter ever, down 65% since the end of December. Demand weakening by the day and producers refusing to cut output. Oil right now at $20 a barrel. American Airlines is applying for federal aid and will sweeten an offer of voluntary leave for staff as it slashes flights. CEO Doug Parker said the carrier will receive about $12 billion, and accepting the money means agreeing to no job or pay cuts through at least September. And Visa is warning that consumer spending has sharply declined, even online. This month, Visa cardholder spending has dropped 4% in the U.S. Overseas spending is down 19%. Courtney Dunhope, Bloomberg Radio. You know your body, and you know when something's off, when something doesn't feel quite right. Don't ignore symptoms like fatigue, joint pain, rashes, and fever. They could be signs of lupus. Listen to your body. Take care of yourself. We're here to help you take control of your health. Learn how at BeFierceTakeControl.org. Brought to you by the Lupus Foundation of America and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In-depth analysis, concise reporting, need-to-know global business news. Around the world and across the markets, Bloomberg connects the dots for decision makers. Stay on top of today's headlines. Follow big breakthroughs in tech. Understand the latest political issues. See how the world's wealthiest are spending their money. Track what's happening in the markets and much more. Subscribe today to Bloomberg, the global standard for business reporting. Get it all at Bloomberg. Bloomberg.com slash subscriptions. What if you could keep the top economic... Act- this week at Tesco, large Easter eggs are three for eight pounds. And we've got a large choice too on all your favorite brands, including Terry's Chocolate Orange, Cadbury's and Maltesers. A three for eight pounds? Why shell out more? Tesco. Every little helps. Available in the majority of larger stores and online, delivery charges may apply on 13th of April. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you, I beg you to come down here right now! Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong With Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk Is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. 
You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. On this week's On the Media, we are awash in messages, but some messengers are more effective than others. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. Meanwhile, some media outlets choose not to air the president's press briefings live, and media critics ponder what's the right balance between good information and all information. All that and more on this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown to a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling to listen. Cup of coffee. Today, he lectures widely on business leadership and is a strong advocate for NJIT's work to combine business education with the power of STEM. NJIT is definitely fostering the innovative thinking for budding entrepreneurs simply because that's the world we live in. NJIT is producing students that have been trained, educated, and given the business acumen to be a contributor to a company. The distinct mission is to develop great STEM scholars. The attributes I've always looked for in team members are heart, smarts, guts, and luck. So we want people with passion intelligence, courage, and never discount luck. The student coming out of NJIT has uh, has experienced all of that. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. Right now, Doctors Without Borders medical teams are operating in some of the most remote and dangerous corners of the world. When front yards become front lines, at the crossroads of conflict and epidemic, where there are no hospitals... That's where we operate. Your response is critical to our response in places where few others will go. That's where we operate. Learn more at doctorswithoutborders.org. News without analysis is like half a bridge. Why is the debt-to-GDP ratio still so important? Those things, once they're set in place, stay around for years. Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com, and iHeartRadio apps, and BloombergRadio.com. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Markets. Coming up, oil is finishing up its worst quarterly results in uh, the history books as we take a look at just absolute plummeting demand as well as surging supplies. We're going to talk about that. Plus, at this point, how much pain has been priced into stocks? Right now, let's find out where things are settling out with Greg Jarrett for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. Well, Lisa, stocks erased earlier losses but are having a bit of trouble hanging on to small gains. This after economic data topped estimates and investors continue to debate whether the market meltdown has ended given the continued spread of the virus. We check the numbers every 15 minutes throughout the trading day here on Bloomberg Radio. The S&P 500 is now up one quarter of 1%, up six. The Dow's up three-tenths of a percent, up uh, 73. And the NASDAQ is up over 1%, up 85. Ten years up 14.30 seconds. The yield is 0.68%. West Texas Intermediate Crude is up 2.8% at 2067. A barrel comex gold is down 1%. At 1626 even per ounce. The dollar yen, 108.08. The euro, dollar 967. And the British pound, dollar uh, 24.32. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. I'm Greg Jarrett. Bloomberg Opinion, informed perspectives, and expert data-driven commentary on breaking news. It's 10.33 on Wall Street. Time to check in with Bloomberg Opinion. We're joined by opinion columnist Julian Lee. He covers all things oil for Bloomberg Opinion. Julian, thanks so much for joining us. We've seen this incredible decline in crude. We've got you know WTI crude about $21 a barrel right now. 
I know it's supply. I know it's demand. Give us a sense of how much of each is really driving oil down here. I think at the moment it's it's mostly demand. Um, you know, we've had the Saudis and the Russians threatening to open the taps, and we're starting to see some of that oil perhaps beginning to move, um, particularly out of Saudi Arabia. They seem to have boosted shipments to storage tanks that they lease in the Mediterranean. Um, we're seeing a, a, a little bit of an increase in shipments going towards the United States, but none of that oil has arrived yet. Um, what we're really seeing, at the moment at least, is a response to a, a, a collapse in demand. Um, you know, there are estimates that demand this week is down uh, by about 26% globally. Uh, that's as if the entire United States, Canada, Mexico, all of Central America, and all of the Caribbean stopped using any oil at all. Well, that's kind of what it feels like. I mean, you look up and there are no airplanes in the sky, and you look out in the street here, and there are no cars going by except for yeah. uh, except for the horrible wail of ambulances, which uh, we've been hearing as people uh, are, are suffering throughout the city. I'm just trying to understand how much pain has been priced in, given the fact that we're running out of storage and that Saudi Arabia seems to have no intention of stopping with the production. I think, um, I, obviously, a lot has been priced in. I mean, as you, you said, we're seeing, you know, WTI down uh, around 20 bucks a barrel. Um, but some of the inland crudes that are finding it difficult to uh, access storage space are, are even now trading in single digits. Um, so they're, they're a lot below the, the international benchmarks. Um, and, you know, we're, as you say, we're not seeing any end to the pressure. We're not seeing any significant uptick in, in road traffic. Um, we're not seeing any of the airlines starting to talk about uh, getting some of their fleet flying again. In fact, some of the, you know, the biggest low-cost carriers in, in Europe have grounded their entire fleets in the last couple of days. So we're really not yet seeing any pickup in demand, and we still have this, this wave of additional oil that has been promised or threatened, um, making its way towards consumers who don't want it. So, Julian, we had President Trump uh, speak with uh, Mr. Putin uh, yesterday. Any sense of what they talked about or whether there can be any movement there on the part of Russia? Um, I, I haven't got any detailed sense of what they talked about. I mean, we, we're hearing that they talked about energy and they talked about uh, the virus and, and responding to it. Um, my own take on it is that nobody is going to act unilaterally. Russia isn't going to do anything um, if it doesn't see other people um, sort of playing their part. And I, I think those other people include the United States. Um, Saudi Arabia and Russia both see that their actions over the last four or five years have helped to spur a doubling of U.S. oil production. And, and quite frankly, I think their view is that this is too big um, for anybody to deal with on their own. We're all in this together. Um, if we're going to cut back, we're all going to cut back. And, and that has to include American oil producers, too. Julian, if we could take a step back and talk about what happens when this period of time is over, do you foresee the destruction in demand being something with permanent ramifications, people going to other sources of energy or changing their habits, or do you think that once things get back on track, the economies globally start recovering, we're going to see oil bounce back up $45, $50 a barrel, maybe even $60 a barrel? I certainly think we're going to see a recovery. Um, whether it's a complete recovery, I think, is, is too early to tell yet. But I, I think that if this is a relatively short-term disruption and if, if things are um, picking back up um, off, the, off the floor by you know, even the autumn or, or the end of this year, uh, I don't think that's long enough for people to have fundamentally changed their habits. People are going to go back to driving. They're probably going to go back to flying to the extent that, that restrictions allow them to do so. Um, I think it takes a, a long-term disruption for people to really change their habits. I, I don't know of anyone at the moment who's saying, oh, I'll, I'll never fly again or I'll never travel overseas again. So I think things will come back. 
what the industry is going to look like when that happens and the ability to meet that rising demand, I think, is going to be another question. Julian Lee, thank you so much for being with us. Julian Lee, Bloomberg Opinion columnist covering all things oil-related. Uh, definitely a brutal time for the shale patch. We've yep. seen uh, we've seen a, a big sort of concern about a surge in bankruptcies among the U.S. oil producers. Meanwhile, big questions abound globally, particularly for developing markets, about what this means. Uh, a really interesting story that I, I was reading this morning, Paul, about the sovereign wealth fund in Norway mm-hmm. having to actually start liquidating some of of its positions, it's the biggest sovereign wealth That's, fund in the world. I was going to say it's the biggest, yeah. Uh, in order to deal with the gaps in the budget that are tied to oil production, uh, yeah. that they get. I mean, it just the ramifications are vast. They are, and they just the ripple effects are just extraordinary. And you, you wonder about the Saudis here with oil at twenty dollars a barrel. Yes, they can, you know, uh, get it out of the ground about half that cost, but they need you know seventy, eighty dollar oil to support their economy. So uh, some issues there that you would think they and Russia would get to the table. You'd think. Not happening right now. (laughs) Uh, Right now, let's head to our 99 studios in Washington, D.C. Nathan Hager there with World and National Headlines. Nathan. Lisa, thank you. The number of confirmed coronavirus cases in the U.S. is rising by about 20,000 a day. Right now, there are nearly 165,000 infections in this country, 3,100 deaths. And New York remains the epicenter with more than 38,000 cases and 900 deaths in New York City alone. The Javits Center in Manhattan has been converted into a 3,000-bed field hospital. Lieutenant General Todd Semonite with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says it's not going to end there. We're looking right now at around 341 different facilities across all of the United States, very similar to the Javits Center. Dr. Anthony Fauci with the National Institutes of Health tells CNN he's starting to see glimmers that social distancing may be slowing the spread of COVID-19, but he says the situation remains dangerous. This pandemic has led to dire stories of medical workers running low on equipment and in some cases being forced to make their own. Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger reports some hospitals have made that a firing offense. An emergency room physician in Washington state says he is out of a job because he gave an interview to a newspaper detailing what he believed to be inadequate protective equipment and testing. In Chicago, a nurse was fired after emailing colleagues that she wanted to wear a more protective mask while on duty. In New York, the NYU Langone Health System has warned employees they could be terminated if they talk to the media without authorization. A spokesman says the policy is to protect patient and staff confidentiality. Jeff Bellinger, Bloomberg Radio. The U.S. is shifting strategy on Venezuela, now calling on both Nic- President Nicolas Maduro and the opposition leader it's backed for more than a year, Juan Guaido, to both step aside. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries, this is Bloomberg. Asset managers who seize change to launch new strategies, add distribution channels, or exploit new technology to re-engineer the investor experience are often rewarded. However, in an industry paralyzed with complexity, few act with agility or decisively. Few run their businesses strategically, yet the most competitive managers in the market know with the right partner and a flexible operating system, you can. Go boldly toward change with SEI Investment Manager Services. Determination and operational strength are both essential factors for growth in asset management. I'm Steve Meyer, President and Head of SEI's Investment Manager Services Division. We know that disruptive forces create opportunities around the world. If you see potential and change, our industry specialists will maximize SEI's integrated platform of data and risk management, global investment operations, compliance support, and investor services to position your asset management business for success. Come grow with us. With SEI Investment Manager Services, you lead the charge in a competitive marketplace. Learn more at SEIC.com slash seize change. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, M&A documents, and mutual fund procedures and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com 
and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Did you know that players of People's Postcode Lottery have raised over £500 million for charities and good causes? They've also won £47 million in prizes so far this year. And it could be your postcode next. Visit postcodelottery.co.uk forward slash radio before midnight on the 23rd of April to play in the May draws. PPL manage lotteries on behalf of good causes. 16 plus, conditions apply, play responsibly. Want to know a great way to discover the latest and greatest sports audio on TuneIn? It's easy. Just make sure push notifications are enabled on your phone to receive recommendations of sports talk, radio, and podcasts, along with important breaking news updates. Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. The moves may be choreographed, but the drama is real. I dare you, I beg you, to come down here right now! Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown, check out the What's Wrong With Wrestling show. And for a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, listen to Talk Is Jericho. For these and more podcasts, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. Leave it to the New York Times to make the most intelligent pop music podcast out there. Welcome to the New York Times Popcast. On the Popcast, the Times music staff gets together for a weekly roundtable on the hottest topics in popular music. From award show autopsies and reactions to new releases to difficult to process scandals and emerging themes in the music landscape, hear distinguished music critics share their perspectives on the latest music news, songs, albums, and artists of note on the New York Times Popcast. Search and favorite Popcast to join the conversation. On uh, this week's On the Media, we are awash in messages, but some messengers are more effective than others. Ventilators, ventilators, ventilators. We need 30,000. Meanwhile, some media outlets choose not to air the president's press briefings live, and media critics ponder what's the right balance between good information and all information. All that and more on this week's On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn today. Working with BNY Mellon, we help alternative investment managers create great experiences for their clients. Whether it's customized financing, securities lending solutions, platform access, or outsourced trading, BNY Mellon's Pershing is a prime broker who's committed to this business and dedicated to meeting your evolving demands. To learn more about the unique and industry-leading solutions for hedge funds and other alternative managers, visit Pershing.com. Pershing, LLC. Member FINRA, NYSE, SIPC. Message and data rates may apply. TNC and privacy terms can be found at babble.com slash terms. Please don't text and drive. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then try Babbel for free by texting EXPLORE to 64000. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just text EXPLORE to 64000 and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or text EXPLORE to 64000 and try it for free. Text E-X-P-L-O-R-E to 64000. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. This flash.